and welcome to Health and Wellness Today. I'm Chanel Jones. As the end of the year rolls around, it's easy to get caught up in the hustle and bustle of the holiday season. But don't let your health take a back seat. On this episode, we'll break down the latest health news, including a new study that suggests hitting the snooze button might actually be good for your health. Plus, we'll reveal simple ways to build healthy habits. And later, how to prepare for a doctor's appointment so you can get the most out of your visit. That's all coming up. But first, we'll begin with some important news from the American Heart Association. According to the latest research, one in three adults has three or more risk factors that contribute to cardiovascular disease, kidney disease, and or metabolic disorders. The condition is called CKM syndrome. And NBC News medical contributor Dr. Natalie Azar walked us through everything we need to know. Dr. Azar, always good to have you. I had not heard of this un until now. CKM, what is that? Yeah, so it is, it's important to remember that the conditions that make up CKM syndrome are not new. It stands okay. for cardiovascular disease, kidney disease, and metabolic diseases or syndromes. And what's encompassed, Craig, in the metabolic is stuff that we have known increases the risk for heart disease for years. We're talking type 2 diabetes, okay. obesity, things like that that fall under that sort of label. But what, what has happened here with the AHA in defining this syndrome is that they're really wanting to sort of reset the framework of how people think about cardiovascular disease risk, okay. prevention, and management. And they've done so, they've made it sort of easy for us because they've stratified CKM into four stages. So let's talk, zero about, to let's four. talk about these yeah. stages so we know what to be aware of, these four yeah. stages. So stage zero is where we hope to all be. That means you have no cardiovascular or kidney or metabolic risk factors. And in this group, Craig, what you're doing is all the lifestyle things, diet, exercise, no smoking, all of that kind of stuff. In stage one, however, you might already have some excess fat or some excess fat, especially in the belly area, mm -hmm. or you might have prediabetes. We're also talking here about lifestyle interventions, losing 5% of your weight loss, for example. Now in stage two, we're starting to have those metabolic risk factors high blood pressure, type two diabetes, maybe you have some kidney disease here. This is where, and this is why it's so important, this is where we can really intervene and we want to start intervening with medications. For yeah. example, Ozempic, Wigovi, different medications to prevent progression of the kidney disease. And then stage three, we have asymptomatic heart disease. That means you've already have established heart disease. Maybe you're also on a statin. And then stage four, where you actually have symptomatic heart disease with or without kidney failure. It's a lot, and there's a lot in there, and I really want to reinforce to people listening yeah. and also to providers like myself, this is actually a, a sort of guidance and a framework that we can all look and say, mm, where do I fit along yeah. here? Where do my patients fit along here? The point is to not progress. The point is to regress. That if you're in stage three or two or one, you want to go backwards, not forwards. And I understand there's also this, this risk calculator now yes. that's also being unveiled and, as well. And this is a, a new component. So the old risk calculator was used to predict a 10-year probability of a heart attack or stroke in people between the ages of 40 and 75. Now the risk calculator is going to start for people at age 30. It's going to predict a 10-year and a 30-year probability for having either a heart attack, a stroke, or congestive heart failure. Oh. And the best thing about the new calculator, Craig, is that it is going to incorporate these new kidney numbers, diabetes numbers, and also what we refer to as the social determinants of health, right? Because think about people who don't have access to a gym or ah. don't have access to good nutrition, and they really stress the collaboration amongst specialists and sort of this more coordinated care for people. So again, not, not a new disease, just a different way to think about cardiovascular disease in the syndrome of all these factors that actually interplay with one another. Dr. Azar, thank you. It was a lot. I just learned, I just learned a lot, too, <laughs> so thank you. Thank you very much. Now to another new study. The Journal of Sleep Research states 69% of people admit to hitting the snooze button in the mornings. But did you know it might actually be good for you? Sleep expert Dr. Carol Ash recently joined Savannah and Hoda to explain the potential benefits. Dr. Mm -hmm. Ash, 
Good morning. You know yeah. you have a couple skeptics here. Yeah. 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 But go ahead, <laughs> say your piece, why snoozing is good for you. Well, it all depends on how you're built. And that okay. is, are you a night owl or a morning lark? And if you're a night owl, you're more likely to hit that snooze button. And right. that's because night owls will wake up in, in the deeper stages of sleep when the alarm first goes off. And when they wake up, they're more likely to be disoriented and have impairment in their mood and performance. Mm -hmm. So they'll hit the snooze button, the night owls. I feel like whenever I hit the snooze button and I think I'm getting 10 extra minutes, I actually wake up and feel much worse. I feel groggier. I feel more out of it. I always say to myself, put your feet on the floor, put your feet on the floor when the alarm goes yeah. off. There is something to that. There is, and that's what the study showed. As you noted, 69% of us are hitting the snooze button. And what happens is if you're that night owl, you're waking up in those deeper stages of sleep and you have what we call sleep inertia. That's that disorientation mm -hmm. and the, the mood impairment and the performance. But what the study showed is when you hit the snooze button, you actually wake up and have improved cognitive performance or better thinking, but your mood, you're still miserable and you're still drowsy. <laughs> <laughs> and you hate yourself for press and snooze. And now you're late. Now you're late. Now you're late. <laughs> but just to be clear, so if you are a night owl, yes. the study is showing that if you hit the snooze button, mm -hmm. that 10 extra minutes of sleep does help you to a certain extent. Yes, mm -hmm. because okay. it takes you out of that deeper sleep into okay. lighter stages and you mm -hmm. wake up without sleep inertia. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, and if you are an early morning person, if you're not a night owl. Yes, well, so th if your physiology, mm -hmm. if you're a night owl, but also for some of us, we're mm -hmm. sleep deprived and we have sleep disorders. So if, if you're not doing what you need to do to, to really have the best sleep hygiene, maintaining the, the environment for sleep, the cool, the dark, and the quiet environment, then you're also likely to be hitting that snooze button and <laughs> waking up with all the problems the same as a night owl. Just curious, like how do you know, other than just instinct, if you're a night owl or a morning yeah, person? What your normal rhythm well, is. You, most of us, if you are a night owl or a morning lark, the night owls tend to be more alert towards the evening hours. They like to exercise in the evening hours, mm -hmm. and the reverse would be true for the morning mm -hmm. lark. The research says go away for two weeks and see what your sleep preferences are, and none of us really have time to no. do that, right? So you have to pay attention to throughout the day where you feel okay. more alert. Okay. I'm a lark. What about you? I'm a definitely <laughs> lark. We're lark. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Ashley. You're Appreciate very it. Welcome. Team Lark. Up next, Maria Shriver's exclusive interview with the man behind the wildly popular Hugh Berman Lab podcast and the six things he says are key to living a healthier life. And later, we'll share simple tips to help women build healthy habits. We'll be right back. back with more health and wellness today. Andrew Huberman launched his podcast in 2021, and since then, he has been dominating the podcast charts around the globe. In each episode of Huberman Lab, he dives deep into scientific research and brings cutting-edge information about health and wellness to his listeners. NBC's Maria Shriver sat down with Andrew for an exclusive interview and discussed how he's helping people optimize their lives. Welcome to the Huberman Lab podcast, where we discuss science and science-based tools for everyday life. If you don't know who Andrew Huberman is, that won't be the case for long. 
The 47-year-old Stanford University neuroscientist has gained a huge following nearly overnight after launching his now chart-topping podcast amid the COVID-19 pandemic in 2021. Are you surprised at its success? I am surprised how popular the podcast has become, what alcohol does to your brain and body. His podcast can run as long as three or four hours, tackling what some might consider wonky topics like dopamine and neuroplasticity. Huberman cites dense scientific research, but makes it digestible for his many millions of devoted listeners. It's really about gaining knowledge of how one's body and brain work and then tapping into the components of our brain that are there from birth and that if we tap into can really afford us a better well-being. At the core of his philosophy are what he calls protocols, ways to improve mental and physical health through sunlight exposure, nutrition, exercise, stress control, relationships, and sleep. I think if people paid attention to these five things plus sleep, gosh, I, I'm certain that everyone would feel so much better. Our mental health and physical health exists on a background of all these fundamental things, and we have gotten very far away from paying attention to these fundamental things. It's really alerted me to the fact that people have a deep interest in feeling better and doing better. They seem to stick around for the science, and they end up learning tools that can help their mental health and physical health. So do you think it's that they want to understand themselves, that they want to understand their brain? They want to understand this entire machine. I think people want to understand how they work. Right. I think they start to feel a sense of agency. And once they feel a sense of agency and control, then all the other stuff seems less scary. Some are critical of his mixing of business and science. His podcasts are supported by ads for supplements and products he endorses. But Huberman says his goal is to give the masses access to zero or low cost tools to improve their mental and physical health. What does the research really say? What works the first time and every time? It's not about purchasing anything. Mm -hmm. While Huberman it's says his audience is divided evenly between men and women, some are crediting him with men increasingly prioritizing their mental and physical health. With men, sometimes the lure has to be a little different. You have to say, hey, this is going to make you a better negotiator. This is going to make yeah. you more effective in finding and building a great relationship. It's going to make you more vigorous. You know, if guys are paying better attention to what they eat, how they exercise, their mental health, certainly, I feel like they and society are just going to benefit. So you think you're changing that for men, that all of a sudden men, perhaps your age and or younger, that it's permissible to talk about their emotional health or their mental health in a way that five years ago it wasn't. I like to think that we are. It's not about becoming more emotional. It's about becoming more functional. One should be able to feel their feelings without their feelings hijacking their behavior or feeling as if you're falling into a pit of despair. They can make choices. Like Andrew mentioned, making good choices is essential to a healthy lifestyle. And our next expert is helping to do just that. NBC News medical contributor Dr. Tara Narula recently stopped by the third hour and offered tips to help women and girls build healthy habits. Dr. Narula, good morning. Good morning. I think it's so important, you know, especially with young girls, to establish habits early. Absolutely. Yes, I have two young girls, 11 and 7, so this is personal. Um, mm -hmm. And adolescence can be a really tough time for a lot of young women, but it's also a time to lay that foundation for healthy habits that are going to make you a healthy and adult. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the first thing to remember, and this is right in my area, is that cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of death for women. So how do we start those healthy habits early? Well, first of all, exercise we all know is important. So young girls should be getting about 60 minutes of cardio on a daily basis and can mm -hmm. work in some muscle and strength training. Oh, wow. Yeah. So uh, how young are we talking about? Yeah. We're starting like young, like five, six. I mean, you hmm. should be getting your kids out there and doing activities um, and, you know, have them walk instead of being pushed in the stroller mm. if they can. Mm -hmm. um, also, you want to think about healthy body image. It's a time where a lot of young girls pay attention to that. And so, you know, I'm a cardiologist. My husband's a plastic surgeon. We're very careful about how we talk about that with our daughters. And we focus on a healthy, strong body. And that means a body mass index, a height weight ratio that falls between the fifth 
as you can see there, an 85th percentile. That's how we grade it for girls. As adults, we talk about BMI with numbers, like 25 or less is healthy. Right. Um, also about stress habits. You want to talk about mindfulness, meditation, yoga, breathing exercises, and then avoiding substances. We know that tobacco, marijuana, vaping, alcohol, all of these things are important. Most kids will start using tobacco. Uh, most adults who use tobacco started before the age of 18. Mm -hmm. So really healthy habits to set you up for heart success down the road. We know mental health can affect your physical uh, well-being. Uh, how do we start early on helping our girls manage that stress and from whether it's social media or, or peer pressure as they go forward. Yeah, Alan, it's so important that we talk about this because half of all mental health disorders really start before the age of eight, uh, 14. Wow. And many of them go undiagnosed, they fly under the radar and they're undertreated. And so it has to be on our radar as parents, as teachers and peers. And one of the important ways to help is to keep girls connected so they don't feel isolated and lonely. And that can be through peer groups, leadership organizations, finding role models at schools, teachers. Parents need to really pay attention to warning signs. Be plugged into what's going on with your kids. Talk to them. Ask them how they feel. Therapy. I mean, I'm a huge advocate for therapy yeah. for yeah. adults and kids if necessary. Um, and also, we want to think about social media. Right. So, you know, the Surgeon General put out a report. I know he was here yesterday mm -hmm. talking about the dangers of social media. And mm -hmm. so many of our kids are using them. If you use social media as a young kid, studies have shown for more than three hours, you're at a 50 percent increased risk Gosh. for things mm -hmm. like depression and anxiety. You mentioned warning signs. What are some of the warning signs you should be looking so at? So clearly, if kids are kind of pulling away, they're, they're more isolated. Um, they're not engaging in their daily activities, they're sleeping more, they're, they're basically losing interest in a lot of things that maybe gave them pleasure. Um, those can be warning signs, but sometimes it, Al, it's just as easy as sitting down and talking yep. to your kids mm -hmm. um, and letting them know that it's okay to talk about anxiety, that they feel nervous about things or that they feel sad. Real quickly on reproductive health for mm -hmm. young women, at what age are they supposed to start getting their first well woman visit? That's a great question. And we all think about that first UIN visit mm -hmm. as women and you know, pap smear are not recommended until 21 or be, or after. But the American College of OBGYNs actually suggests that girls start to see an OBGYN between the ages of 13 and kind of 18. And that is really to build that trusted relationship. It's not about a pap smear or pelvic mm -hmm. exam. It's about talking about menstruation, for example, what's normal, what to do if they have pain. Most girls will start menstruating between 12 and 14. Mm -hmm. To talk about gender issues, safe sexual practices, STDs, one important conversation is around the HPV HPV vaccine. We know that HPV is a preventable, if we treat it with the vaccine, we can prevent oropharyngeal cancer, cervical cancers. 85% um, of us will get infected with HPV. And so the recommendation is that starting at ages 11 to 12, girls can get their first dose, followed six months later with a second dose. If you start after age 15, it's about three doses. But these are really important conversations to have, and a GYN is a safe place for a lot of girls to have those conversations that they may not feel comfortable talking yeah. to parents about. Okay. Dr. Narula, that was just so helpful. Thank you so much. You. Covered a lot of ground there. Yeah. Thank you, Doc. Now that we've covered women's health, coming up, we're switching gears to men's health and the important numbers to know for all ages. But first, how to make the most out of your doctor's appointments and what you should do before, during, and after your visit. We're back right after this.
Welcome back to Health and Wellness Today. Whether it's an annual checkup or follow-up, it can be easy to feel rushed during a doctor's visit or feel unsure about the information you were given. But don't worry, Dr. Natalie Azar is back with a step-by-step -step guide to help you prepare and make the most out of your appointments. So, so what do you recommend before we even get to the doctor? What are some of the things we should do to prep for the visit? There's a couple of things. And I, I know I've said it here before, and I say this to my patients all the time, especially if you're going in for a follow-up appointment. You know, some follow-up appointments are 15 to 20 minutes. Yes. It is not a long time. And by the time you get done talking about your children, you realize that you have like five minutes left, right? <laughs> so make sure that you that you bring a list of the, the three most important things that you want to discuss. And don't wait until the end. This is what I say to people all the time, especially if it's an important symptom like chest pain, come in right away and say, these are the things I'd like to get through to make sure that you give them enough time. Definitely bring or make sure that you send in your outside medical records. This is important. Not only will it make the appointment much more efficient, but you'll avoid repeating tests that have mm -hmm. always that have already been done. We talk about how extraordinarily expensive medical care is. Would it be helpful to send it ahead of time? Yeah, absolutely. And just make sure the doctor has received it, though, right. and that it can be scanned into the chart, even if it's an outside medical record. Bring your medication, and that includes supplements, things that aren't prescription. A lot of drug interactions can happen with supplements. We talk about that a lot. And the last one is really important depending on where your doctor practices yeah. and where you live in the country if you know you're going to need an interpreter to translate make sure that your that the office has that capability or you can bring a family member mm -hmm. who can speak English or the the language um, that is needed for you that's those are great tips so that's that's all we need to take with us to the appointment, to the appointment. during the appointment <clears throat> what should we be doing so we'll start with the, as I mentioned, obviously bringing somebody with you if you need help with, with, with the language, bring a family member or a friend, and especially if you're a senior, yes. bring a child with you to help write, take down notes, to make sure that you're truly understanding what the doctor is saying. We welcome that, right? Because we want to make sure that you as a patient are understanding what's going on. Take copious notes, whether it's on your phone, write things down, ask questions immediately if you don't get something. Find out what next steps are and also ask for material. Do you have handouts? Is there a website I can go to? Do you have any brochures, any videos that can accompany or complement what the doctor is saying? And at the very end, just to make sure you've gotten it all, ask the doctor to recap. What are we doing? What's the mm -hmm. investigation? What's the follow-up? Recap. Okay, yeah. so you think you've processed everything, you go home, and yes. then what? <clears throat> the most important thing is to follow the doctor's instructions. But if you do have questions, make sure that you write them down. And this is really important. I would recommend not, every time you think of a question, to reach out to your doctor and ask that question. Take a beat, take a couple, you're laughing, take a couple of I days. I've done that. Oh yeah, I, I can have, only imagine how many way, you get. That's right? ask, da, da, da. Yep, take a couple of days, make a list, and then also ask what your doctor's preferred communication is. Mm -hmm. Do they want a phone call? Are you messaging through the electronic medical record? Make a list, and don't be surprised if your doctor says schedule a follow-up to discuss mm -hmm. if the list is lengthy. Track your symptoms and your side effects from your medication, and this is probably one of the most important things. Before, let's say your doctor starts you on a new medication, yeah. you're having side effects. Do not stop abruptly without asking if it's safe to do so. Not all medications can be stopped without a taper, you can speak to us, you can speak to the pharmacist, super, super important. And that's about it, that's oh, all that, on that, my that list. Great. You right. checked it, you checked that, off your list. That was a yes. great checklist. Yeah. Yeah. Nice nice Thanks, Dr. Azar. Thank you so much. Just ahead, we are talking men's health, including how to manage high blood pressure and when to screen for prostate cancer. That's all coming up next on Health and Wellness Today.
We're back with a focus on men's health. November is also known as Movember to raise awareness for men's health and wellness. Here's board certified colorectal and general surgeon, Dr. Cedric McFadden, to break down the key numbers every man should know. All right, so let's start off with numbers that you should go over with your doctor. First up, 120 over 80. Yeah, so most people know this number, right? This is the blood pressure range, and this is characterizing sort of a normal blood pressure. Mm -hmm. Now, blood pressures can range. They can vary based on person to person. They can vary based on age, and also it can vary based on gender. Mm -hmm. Men are more likely to be diagnosed and to be found to have high blood pressure. If this number is high, there's some definite things that you can do that can help lower that number. And one of which is reduce the sodium or the salt intake. Mm -hmm. Now, that may be a little bit challenging because salt's in everything. Sure. It's in our seasonings, it's in our sauces, it's in canned vegetables. Here's a little trick. If you are using canned vegetables, take a time to pour the liquid out, mm -hmm. rinse the vegetables. Oh. You can reduce the salt, con salt content by nearly 40 to 50%. Really? What Just about alcohol? Alcohol, reducing alcohol as well, as well as uh, making sure you're having good exercise. In. If you don't, if that doesn't bring your number down, then what? Well, this is a conversation you need to be having with your doctor, and it's not just one reading that's going to diagnose you with hypertension. It's the trend, and if it's not responding to diet, exercise, you may need some medication. Let's yeah. talk about the magic number of 55. Yes. What do men need to know at that number? So this is the age that most men are gonna start screening for prostate cancer. Uh, prostate cancer, depending on the risk, uh, that age may vary. So if you uh, have a family history of prostate cancer or you're African American, you may begin screening probably in the mid 40s. Now this is a protein that's produced normally by the prostate and when elevated, it can indicate prostate cancer, but it doesn't have to be prostate cancer. There are normal things that can cause an elevated PSA such as inflammation in the prostate or BPH. As you get older, that number changes. And so mm -hmm. you may want to talk with your doctor about what does my number mean and does it make sense for me with my age? And are there, there uh, groups that are more prone to this that have to worry about this a little bit more? Yeah, so that's the group that's going to start screening sooner. That's African-American men. That's also people who have a family history of prostate cancer. Okay, thanks, yes. Doc. Thank you. All right. Dr. McFadden, yeah. let's talk about that. Apparently, this is a number we can track ourselves. We're talking yes. about yes. 150. What's the significance of that number? So this is the number of minutes per week that you need to be getting moderate to intense exercise okay. per week. And, you know, men, uh, you know, one out of three men in the U.S. are overweight, and this can really help reduce that. It seems like a lot, but if you break it apart, that's about 30 minutes, five days a week. Now, this is moderate intense. So this is activity that when you're doing it, mm -hmm. you're doing it so much that you can talk, but maybe you can't sing. Right, so this is. He can't you know, sing anyway. Yes. Wow. But, but he can dance. Yes. Oh and even that intense dancing can increase your heart rate. So that's the thing you can do. They also recommend, CDC recommends that you get some muscle strengthening exercises at least two days a week and walking. Al's a great proponent of that. We used to say 10,000 steps per day. The recent publication by the European Journal of Preventive Cardiology, they've actually brought it down to at least 4,000 steps mm. per day oh. that can reduce mm. the rate of uh, death or right. reduce the risk of death for any cause, including heart disease. The next number is a range, four to five. What does yes. that mean? So four to five servings of fruit or vegetables a day. Okay. All right. So we have to be very intentional about this. Men don't eat vegetables compared it's to women, true. right? So you have to be intentional about getting a daily serving. Now, How big is a serving? So we're talking an apple. We're talking half a cup of vegetables, all right? Mm. So if you can plan ahead, take an apple in the car, make it a part of what you use as you drive throughout the day. That's great. That's good. And then we put we put some suggestions on the screen there. Absolutely. Dr. McFadden, thanks as always. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank and I appreciate that. Helpful. Appreciate your kind words about the dancing as well. <laughs> <laughs> that wraps up another episode of Health and Wellness Today. Thank you for tuning in. We'll see you next time on Today All Day. Walmart. 
welcome to the Today All Day Kitchen. We're turning everyday leftovers into brand new dishes for the Today Table. With a little imagination and a few fresh ingredients, we'll show you how to make amazing next day dishes. I'm starting off your morning right with a hearty protein packed quiche. And I'll be whipping up the perfect lunch or anytime snack. Crispy rice cakes with the perfect savory toppings. And I'm making a velvety chocolate mousse with a surprising ingredient. Get ready. Because we're clearing out the fridge. And leaving no leftover behind. You can shop the ingredients featured here from our sponsor Walmart by scanning the QR code. Today earns a commission from purchases made through links on today.com. Whenever I'm doing meal prep, I usually end up with a few leftover ingredients. Today, I'm using some leftover rotisserie chicken to make a quiche with spinach, feta, and sun-dried tomatoes. So, let's get started with our crust. I've got some store-bought pie crust right here, and I'm gonna lightly flour my surface. You don't need too much. All the hard work has been done for us. We're just gonna roll out our pie crust. And be really gentle with it because it is pretty fragile. All right, I'm gonna sprinkle the pie crust with a little bit of flour, and we are going to roll this out. Just gently enlarge it, so that way it'll fit comfortably inside of our pie pan. Okay, I've got this rolled out really nicely, so I'm gonna take my pie pan, I'm just gonna put it right on top of it, just like this. And just take your fingers and lightly go around the edges. I'm telling you, the first time I did this, I felt super accomplished because I'm like, I'm a baker now. I'm, I'm baking. Mama, look at me. And then you're gonna take these edges that are falling over. You're gonna just fold them up under here so that way you kind of get an even crust. This is the today all day kitchen, right? So we're gonna just make it a little bit fancier. So after I get done doing this, we're gonna add some texture and some form to this pie crust. And all you're gonna do, it's a trick I learned. You're gonna take your finger right up under here and crimp it down, press down, and pull it out. Down, and pull it out. All the way like this. And go all the way around the pie crust. I know, the first time I did this, I was like, yo, Kev, look at you. He's a baking machine. And keep going around the edges. All right, the last one here. All right, now look at this. It looked like it's from a bake shop, right? I know. I did it myself. And you could do it too. So with our pie crust ready, it is camera ready. We're gonna let this rest in the fridge while I prep the rest of the ingredients. Next thing we're gonna prep is our spinach. All right, I'm going to set a stainless steel skillet on a medium high heat. In goes a little bit of water. That's all we wanna see. Watch this, boom. In goes the spinach. It's like the Wizard of Oz. It's melting, it's melting. You shouldn't have to cook the spinach for more than one minute. And boom, this is just about right because I don't want it to be completely mushy. I'm gonna take it out. All right, spinach is cooked. Move on to the other star, the sun-dried tomatoes. All right, we're gonna stack our tomatoes together. Just take a knife. We're just gonna dice them. Look at all this goodness and they're very fragrant too. Now, moving on to my leftover rotisserie chicken, we're gonna take the skin off of the chicken, peel that back. I know some of y'all are just moaning right now, like, <laughs> what are you doing? It's all right, don't worry, there's still a lot of flavor in this dish and you're not gonna miss it. Just going to make sure that there are no bones in here. And you can pull it apart with your hands first, especially if it's cold and left over. If it's warm from just purchasing it, then you may have to use some forks. But I just like to get in there and just use my pans. But of course you do what's most comfortable for you. And try not to do a little bit of this, which I am so guilty of. But you know, a little tasting along the way isn't a bad thing. What home cook doesn't nibble and taste along the way? That's how you know it's good. Let's move on with the recipe. The next part that we have to do, we've got to prep our eggs. So I'm gonna be using some whole eggs. If you are team lean and mean and you want a wonderful, delicious egg white quiche, mmm, can't wait to wake up to that on the weekend. <laughs> I'm kidding, I eat egg white. But for this one, 
my leftovers deserve whole eggs. Extra protein, a little extra fat, a little extra love. That's all I'm saying. Add in a little bit of milk. Whisk this up. And we're gonna season it with a little bit of sea salt and pepper for the culture. Boom, salt, pepper. The internet will let you know if you cook unseasoned food right away. And I'm pretty sure our today all day kitchen fam is no different. <laughs> there we go. Now it is time to bring together our beautiful quiche. I'm gonna add in our chicken. Just spread it out. This is gonna be a really meaty protein pack quiche. And you wanna spread it out very well on the pie crust to make sure that every slice gets a little bit of that protein. There we go. Adding in some of our sun-dried tomatoes. Sprinkle those around as well. In goes the spinach. There we go. Our last bit of a protein boost and flavor boost. The feta. Just kind of crumble it up. I bought this crumble, but if you want to buy the entire block, just use a fork to crumble it up on a plate and then do it. There we go. Now let's give this one more whisk and we're gonna pour in our egg. Watch the slow pour. Getting a little bit more, just some texture on top. Cracked pepper. Boom. Look at this beauty. It looks amazing before we've even baked it. This is what we want. We're gonna bake this beauty for about 45 minutes at 350 or until the center is set. I've let this cool for about 15 minutes. It's still really warm, so it's perfect. You can see when I move it, there's no movement there. Let's dig in. I'm gonna give myself a nice, generous portion of this. Oh my gosh, and look how creamy it is. Look at it. The heat has just made that feta just even creamier. I can't wait to dig in. Self-control and portion control is gonna be hard with this one, so don't write me and complain. Okay, if I ate the whole thing. <laughs> I understand. Mmm, mmm. I guarantee you, your friends, your family will love this. Whenever I order takeout, I usually have a ton of rice left over. You could always just reheat and eat what you've got, but I love making crispy rice cakes. So many different cultures have their own version of crispy rice, and now it is all over TikTok, so I cannot wait to show you mine. We are going to start with our rice, and I have three cups right here. So we're gonna add a couple other things to it to boost its flavor and also make sure that it all sticks together and doesn't fall apart when frying. So what we wanna do is we just wanna take some cornstarch right here, and we are going to add in a little bit of water, and then we're actually gonna add in some lemon. We're just going to whisk it on up into a slurry. It smells fabulous, super fragrant. 
We are going to pour it over the top of the rice. I'm also going to season it with some kosher salt. A nice little three finger pinch. And then we are just going to fold it all together. Here I have an eight by eight square baking dish and I have lined it with some plastic wrap. So we're just going to take that rice, pop it directly into the pan and with our fingers, which I find clean hands can honestly be the best tools in the kitchen, we are going to just press that rice down into the corners of the pan. Looking good. It is always so much fun to take leftovers and turn them into something new and awesome. I think that a lot of people don't realize the beauty of half of the work already being done for you. We're going to freeze it for at least one hour, up to two hours, and while that's freezing, I'm gonna get some of my toppings ready. I love topping my rice cakes with the perfect soft boiled egg. So I'm gonna show you how to make the perfect one, my little tips and tricks to do it. First thing you wanna do, boil some water. I am going to take a spider, you could also take a slotted spoon, and delicately lower those eggs one by one into the boiling water. While those eggs are going, let's get to work on our lemony scallion yogurt sauce. Starting off, I have two cleaned scallions right here. What we're going to do is we're going to trim off the root of those scallions, and then we will slice them on an angle, also known as a bias, into really thin rounds. So we'll just take that, pop it directly into the sauce, and then we are going to take that lemon half that we have from earlier, squeeze all that juice right into the yogurt, and then we're gonna hit it with a little bit of salt to awaken its flavor. So we're gonna mix this up, and there you go. We have our yogurt sauce. And it almost looks like a looser version of scallion cream cheese. Our eggs are done. We are going to strain them and immediately transfer them into our ice bath. And what the ice bath is gonna do is it's going to shock the eggs and immediately stop them from continuing to cook. Another thing that I love about an ice bath is as that egg cools, what's going to happen is the white is going to slowly pull back from the shell, creating a really thin layer that will allow us to peel these eggs beautifully. Okay, our eggs have been chilling out and it is time to crack them. So what I'll do is I'll take the egg and I will Tap it on a flat surface to break up that shell. And then here's my trusty sidekick. Say hello to the spoon. We wanna make sure that the spoon goes underneath that coating. And the spoon is going to do a gorgeous job of lifting that shell right off. Wow. How satisfying is that? I mean, come on, you guys, take a look at that. Absolutely perfect soft boiled egg. Our rice is nice and frozen and it is time to fry them up. So we're going to start by adding avocado oil to our skillet. We are going to heat this up until it is shimmering. And while we're waiting for that to heat up, let's slice up our rice. We're going to take that overhang that we have and delicately lift the rice block out. Look at how great that looks. Pull it back. And then what I like to do to make sure that we have even squares is I like to slice off about a half of an inch off of the sides of the rice. And you really wanna make sure that you're using a sharp knife here. Fabulous. Take this, compost it, and then we are going to cut these into nine even pieces, about two inches by two inches. We are going to crisp these up for about five minutes per side until we get a nice golden brown crust on the exterior. Set your timers. 
These are looking really good, and now it is time to flip. Ooh, gorgeous golden. We love to see that. These are looking beautiful. We're gonna transfer them to a wire rack lined baking sheet. And we wanna salt these rice cakes while they are still hot so that they can hold on to the salt that hits them. Okay, I'm going to fry up this next batch and then it will be the moment we're all waiting for, topping the rice cakes and eating them. You can top these any way you like, but I'm gonna show you my favorite way to serve these crispy rice cakes. We'll start with our beautiful avocado. Whenever I'm picking an avocado, I always wanna make sure that when I press down, it has a little bit of give. Another great way to test is I'll look at the top of the avocado where the stem is. If you pull the stem out and you see that the inside is a nice bright green color, that is how you know the avocado is perfectly ripe. So we are going to take a sharp knife. We will insert it into the top of the avocado until you hit the pit. And then delicately roll the avocado around, slicing through to cut it in half. Look at that, absolutely gorgeous. As far as peeling the avocado is concerned, instead of scooping it out with a spoon, I love to peel the skin off with my fingers. And then we are going to take the avocado and with the tip of our knife, we will slice into thin strips. I just really love how fancy it looks when you slice it. I think adding a nice, punchy, bright element with a lemon wedge is an awesome way to just give a little extra oomph to your overall presentation. Next up, we have our eggs. This is a really fun trick that I love to use when I am serving these eggs on our crispy rice. You're gonna take your egg. If you want, you can dunk it in a little bit of water or you could even just roll it in that residual lemon just to get it slightly wet. And then what you're going to do is you're gonna take that seasoning and you're going to roll the egg into the Everything Bagel seasoning. I'm a big fan of Everything Bagel seasoning, huge fan. And once this is nicely seasoned, you'll take your sharp knife and slice right through revealing that perfect jammy yolk. Are you kidding me? I mean, how stunning is that? That is incredibly satisfying. So let's bring back one of our crispy rice pieces. This one has that avocado on it. And for this one, some of our pastrami smoked salmon. I love pastrami smoked salmon. So it's just your traditional smoked salmon, except it has pastrami spice on it. Now I'm gonna plate these up and make them even more gorgeous with our sauce. And what I like to do is just create a really beautiful swoosh on the bottom of the platter and just spread it into a really beautiful layer. Now it is time to adorn our platter with our crispy rice. So remember those green scallion tops that we saved earlier? We are going to take them and just sprinkle them over the tops just for a little extra jewelry and flavor. Okay, I can't contain myself. I have to try one of these. I'm gonna take a little lemon, squeeze it over the top. Let's give it a taste. Okay, first of all, do you hear that crunch? That is stunning. I just have to say that this is one reason why you should never toss out your leftover rice. I promise you, you can always put it to good use.
When I first went vegan, I thought I'd had to give up chocolate desserts for good, since so many dessert recipes include dairy or eggs. But now, my day isn't complete without something chocolatey and sweet. It didn't take long for me to discover the magic of aquafaba. What is that, you ask? Well, it's the leftover ingredient that's the key to my fluffy chocolate mousse. And it's actually found in a can of chickpeas. But before we get to that, let's start melting some chocolate. So I have my chocolate here over a double boiler, so let's turn on the heat. We want to set this to a slow simmer. And there's all different varieties of vegan chocolate. I'm using mini chips, but they also have chunks, they have big chips, and it also comes in whole bars. I like the mini chips because they melt quickly, they're easy to work with, and I just want to get my mousse done quickly, so why not go the easy route? Our water is at a slow, gentle simmer, so our chocolate is gonna start melting. You wanna make sure to continuously stir it so then that the heat can be distributed throughout the chocolate and it'll melt evenly. Okay, so once all the chips are melted, our next ingredient for our mousse base is some vegan sweetened condensed milk. This is made entirely from coconut and it is so good, it's gonna add a nice creamy base and really thicken up that chocolate and kind of make it a ganache consistency. Now, you can flavor this however you'd like, but I like mine a little bit luxurious and indulgent, so we're gonna give this an amaretto flavor. So it's gonna be a bit of almond, a bit of vanilla. It's gonna taste like Italy. So to this, we're gonna add one ounce of amaretto liquor. Once the liquor is incorporated, we're gonna add in two flavorings, a splash of vanilla and a splash of almond. Almond extract smells so good, but a little goes a long way. It's very strong, so make sure to just add a tiny splash because otherwise it'll become too bitter and overwhelm the whole dish. And it should look like this, glossy and thick almost like the consistency of a ganache. So this looks great, so I'm gonna remove it from the heat and let it cool completely. So while our chocolate cools, we can work on our secret ingredient, our aquafaba. So aquafaba may sound fancy, but all it is is the water from a can of chickpeas. Instead of tossing this, which most people do, if you whip aquafaba up, it turns into a consistency almost of an egg white or like a meringue. You can use it in all different ways. The way I would think about aquafaba is the same as egg whites. So if you were to use egg whites in a dish or even whipped cream, you can substitute it with aquafaba. I recommend getting a can of low sodium or no salt added chickpeas. That way the water doesn't affect the flavor of what you're making. So what we wanna do is to our stand mixer fitted with the whip attachment, we want to make sure that our bowl is chilled. So right before I whip up my aquafaba, I like to keep my bowl in the fridge for at least 10 to 15 minutes so it gets ice cold. And the reason why we wanna do that is because it'll then help us whip up the aquafaba so it turns into stiff peaks. If it's too warm, then it's not gonna whip up and it's just gonna fall flat. So lock in your mixer and we're gonna set it to high. So I'm gonna stop the mixer because I wanna add a little bit of cream of tartar. This is gonna help stiffen up the peaks and get us that nice, glossy, stiff peak that we're looking for in a chocolate mousse. So let's go ahead and add that in and turn on mixer back on high. Let's give it another minute or two to get it real stiff because the stiffer it is, the more delicate and airy our mousse is gonna be. Okay, our aquafaba is looking good. Yep, this is exactly what we want. A stiff peak, it doesn't fall. So now we want to fold our aquafaba into fold it in. If I just sat here and stirred it, it would turn into a soup and it would not set into a mousse. So we wanna make sure we're adding in as much air as possible. So I keep folding until I don't see any more streaks and then I go in with some more dollops of aquafaba. Okay, this looks beautiful. So we're ready for our next dollop. 
This is looking great, it's all an even color. So now I just have to get into little jars so it can set in the fridge. So I'm gonna clear up my area so I can do that. So we're gonna pour this in here and set it in the fridge overnight. So our mousse have set overnight and they look beautiful. You can see they're perfectly set. There's no liquid. You can see all of the beautiful air bubbles. It does not look vegan, let me tell you. I'm garnishing these with fresh cherries, but you can easily use a jarred cherry like an amarena, which will go really well with this. Okay, now I think it's fair to say that I have been waiting way too long to actually dig into this. So why don't we go for a taste? Can you believe this texture? This is made from chickpea water. No egg whites, no dairy, chickpea water. All right, you ready? Wow, it's so airy, yet so decadent. I hope this inspires you guys to cook low waste and zero waste recipes at home and try this mousse. But for now, I'm gonna keep enjoying and indulging. Mm. Hey everybody, welcome to The Boost. Now that it is officially the holiday season, we hope to bring a little extra joy to your day. Up first, we caught up with actress Jennifer Garner and her work with Save the Children, a charity organization that's helped more than a billion kids worldwide. NBC Cynthia McFadden joined Garner to learn about her efforts in rural areas. And the dynamic duo had a surprise on the books for some very deserving kids. It's 20,000 square miles of agricultural heaven, California's Central Valley. Half of the nation's fruits and vegetables come from here and 75% of the nuts. I mean, it doesn't get much more rural than this. No. Jennifer Garner and I took a walk down the main and only street in downtown Alpa. There's one grocery store behind us, one gas station beyond that. And this teeny little tiny library. Tiny little library. Okay. But the contradiction of rural America. This is where our food comes from, but in that grocery store, there's not one fresh apple, there's not one piece of lettuce or yeah. spinach, not one banana. This is a food desert. Almost all the thousand or so residents here work picking everything from blueberries to pistachios, yet 54% of them live below the poverty line. The grim reality is the people who pick this food cannot afford to eat it. Once a month, families get in line to sample the bounty growing all around them. They're given enough fresh food for about four days. Just about the whole town shows up. At nine, whenever we get our call that there's gonna be food given away, we're already in line waiting for that because it's, we need it. Save the Children and a local food bank sponsor this distribution. For those who can't make it here, Save the Children delivers. Thank you. Jennifer Gardner has been a board member and an ambassador for Save the Children for 15 years.
There is no police station or hospital. What there is is this school, the center of the community and its hope for the future. It's a beautiful day. And top of the school's agenda is battling a staggering literacy problem. Thank you guys for reading with me. Thank you. Thank you. The kids, they all at the end feel entitled to come up and throw their arms around you. It makes me feel like they know I'm on their side. For over 70% of the students here, English is a second language. And while there is a school library, it only has a thousand books total. But things are getting better, a lot better, says the superintendent of schools, Troy Hayes. So what's the evidence it's working? We know that in over a three-year period, we've gone from 18 to 86 percent of our students meeting college entrance requirements. In three years? In three years. If you were to summarize the secret sauce, it is? I think it's just, it's, it's almost like this extravagant compassion. And that means getting the staff to believe in big dreams, so the kids will. There have been such strides made in this community. Mm. What does that say to you? It's just a reminder that there is hope. We should be celebrating this superintendent. We should be lifting up these teachers. But more than that, it also just asks us to pay attention. We can't take our eyes off of so much real estate of this country and just let it, let rural America kind of just fall. Last night at the school's annual Thanksgiving celebration, the cafeteria was the place to be for students and their parents. And we came with a couple of surprises. You can take home as many books as you can read. Scholastic donated more than 700 books to the students here at Al Paw Unified Schools so that each child can have books of their very own to take home. We have a room full of readers. And that's not all. Scholastic also pledged an additional 5,000 books to the Alpaw Unified Schools Library. What does it mean to have books? First, the kids have books at home. We are so grateful. This is going to be a huge uh, thing for us in our community, so thank you so much. Okay, it was a wonderful day and a wonderful night. Mm -hmm. we, we were privileged to be there. Really. Uh, well, you too. We love it. When you two get together, we know mm -hmm. something good's going to happen. This town has so much resilience. The school has shown so much success. Jennifer, how did they do it? How'd they pull it off? They did it with the belief of a superintendent. Leadership is everything. And they did it with Save the Children's Help being there, supporting his vision, supporting the community's vision to lift up these kids and get them reading, get them excited, get them just ready and engaged to learn. Well, Jennifer, you mentioned that 70% of the kids' English is a second language. They're learning English. How do they get ready for kindergarten? Can you imagine how complicated it's hard enough to learn to read and then you're also having to learn a whole new language that your parents don't speak? Well, you know, Save the Children hires locally, so our staff is pretty much bilingual and that really helps reduce the shame that comes with not being able to speak the target language because shame just stops progress, right? And then the books in our book exchanges, they'll be bilingual. They'll have an English word on one side and the Spanish word on the other, and that helps the parents learn as well. And of course, we teach parents there are all kinds of ways to share a story. You can do a picture walk. As long as you're talking and looking at books together, the magic's happening. Mm -hmm. Cynthia, you've covered so many stories, as we, we keep mm -hmm. saying, you and Jen are like a team now. We, like, we love this. Keep it going. <laughs> but what have you noticed? What's working here? What, mm -hmm. what is separating this work from some of the other things that you've seen? Well, you know, there are so many factors in any success, but one of the things that the superintendent said to me that I thought was so powerful was the first thing he did when he came in four years ago, gather all the teachers, he said, you know, we have to change how we see ourselves. We're not losers, we're winners, and these kids are winners, and when we believe that about ourselves, we can help the kids believe it. You know, dream big, and they really are dreaming big. We, we had wonderful conversations with these children. Yeah, I think it's important to remember, like, these are not poor kids, they are kids living in poor circumstances. Yes. They've got tons of potential yep. and you guys Absolutely. are you guys are putting 100%. it on display. Keep your show on the road, Keep you guys. Going. You're making us feel so good, <laughs> giving us hope. We appreciate it. Thank you. We have Mississippi coming. Yes. Okay. <laughs> We're ready. We love it, Jen and Cynthia. Thank, thank you, you so much. When her book signing was a bust, one author thought it would be a heartbreaking chapter. However, 
She found fans she never knew about. It turned out to have a happy ending. Take a look. A book event can be a moment for authors to relish the accomplishment and connect with adoring readers. Or it can be Suzanne Young's experience this week. The first signing of her new teen novel, In Nightfall, was, she admits, sparsely attended. I went into the bathroom at one point to try to hold my emotions in because I was just really disappointed. Young posted a pic calling it a career low point, crying my entire way home, she wrote. I was going to delete the tweet and immediately I saw other authors were like, oh, Suzanne, I've been there, like this happened to me. One fellow author commiserated. It stings, but it's a blip. I almost never think of this one anymore unless someone mentions Boulder. Acclaimed author Jody Picoult even reached out, telling Young, we have all been there. I can't even express how grateful I am for that support. It, it really gave me perspective that I wish I had before I tweeted, but I do now. We talk a lot about the dangers of social media. This seems like an example of how social media can bring us together. It really was just, I mean, thousands of tweets of people saying either they had experienced it or it was gonna get better. And it was just, pure kindness on the internet. How about that? Kindness on the internet. As for the book, her 22nd published novel. My publisher describes it as the Lost Boys meets Buffy the Vampire Slayer. For anyone interested, there are signed copies. She has a few extra. Stephanie Gosk, NBC News. Just ahead, the popular Native American restaurant that is delighting diners with traditional indigenous food. Coming up right after the break. Welcome back to The Boost. November is National Native American Heritage Month, and to celebrate, we headed to California, where a popular restaurant is helping our country's traditional food make a comeback, all while garnering rave reviews. This is Chef Crystal Wapapa's kitchen. I'm kind of chilling it, kind of cooling it down. But it's so much more than that. This restaurant represents sovereignty. It represents land back. It represents reclaiming. Reclaiming Native American food traditions that were disrupted by European settlers. And with the Federal Indian Removal Act of 1830, when Congress forced more Native Americans to leave their homelands, their crops were burned, animals were killed, and Native people were forced to eat government-issued rations high in fat and sugar. But the food served here is seasonable, sustainable, and Native American grown. I always tell them where Atlantic comes from, what tribe it comes from, how is it grown, and how it's in season. Whether it's blue corn tortillas from the Ute Nation. Isn't it beautiful? Bison stew. I'm going to have this come to a good little boil. Or Buffalo Creek squash, planted and tended by Wapapa's kitchen staff. And what we eat, we are when it comes to connecting and um, having that healing connection. I want people, when they come into the restaurant, I want them to have that connection, um, native or non-native. Oakland resident Chris James says the food takes him to America's true origins. This place being Native American owned, right? The song goes, this land is your land, this land is my land, but this land is their land, right? Um, and so if we're gonna be on their land, the least we can do is you know, support 
uh, Native American culture. Any time that I can support another Native American is very important to me. Celebrating a year in business this month, Wapapa's Kitchen has 14 employees representing 17 different tribes, including Chef Wapapa's three daughters. My hopes for Wapapa's Kitchen is for everyone to be knowledgeable on Native foods. Like her mom, Rosario makes a point of educating diners on some of their more unexpected ingredients. Their eyes get like really big, so they're like, what's that? You sell deer like in your restaurant? And I'm like, yeah, we sell deer in a restaurant. I've never thought about like eating an acorn before, so I thought that that was just an interesting thing and like something I wanted to try. A self-described food warrior, Chef Wapapa, who is Kickapoo, also runs a highly sought after catering business and has been invited to serve her food at the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences and even the White House. She was the first indigenous chef on the Food Network show Chopped but she says she cooks to honor her ancestors. You have that relationship with these foods and how they want to be presented, but in our culture and what we believe, that's our ancestors calling out. That's our ancestors wanting to heal and touch each individual. Each spoonful, a celebration of the rich flavors of this land's first inhabitants. For Sunday Today, Nyella Charles, NBC News. Now to a skateboard company that combines Native American culture and community a mission 20 years in the making. I think the role of art in Apache culture has always been important because we made art for one another. When I made Doug, I painted his skateboard. I remember thinking, well, 100 years ago, I would have made him a bow and arrow, but now I made him a skateboard. The seed for Apache skateboards was planted 20 years ago when a young Doug Miles Jr. asked his dad for a special gift. We were at the mall. He said, Dad, he goes, I need a board and my board is broken. I didn't have enough money for a name brand skateboard with art on it. I said, son, I'll buy you the blank one and I'll paint it when I get home. I painted an Apache warrior on there. When he got home, he said, Dad, everybody wants one. And so, Apache Skateboards was born. It resonated because at the time, they made us feel proud. We want to see ourselves on the skateboards. As an artist, Doug Miles Sr. hoped his designs could teach others about his culture. Telling the story of Apache history was important. The struggle that Apache people had to deal with in America hasn't really been talked about from an Apache perspective. The Apache point of view is extremely important. I'm just one person. And it's just one skateboard. And even though I may be just scratching the surface, it was a good, fun way to encourage kids to learn more about their history. As the company has grown, so has the popularity of the sport in Native American communities. I think skateboarding is popular because you get to express yourself in all types of different ways, whether it's painting, art, music, filmmaking because skateboarding is all of those things you know as a father watching doug become the skateboarder that he is uh, it's almost unfathomable for me because i'm an artist but his art is on the skateboard and when i look at him skateboarding i always think to myself he is literally reshaping space and creating new uses for space out here on the res Today, the father and son team are on a mission to increase access to skate parks on reservations. In these Native American communities, there's not a skate park on every reservation. And when there are skate parks, they don't take it for granted. Shaping and strengthening their community along the way. And I think that's this thing that keeps calling us home. It keeps uh, causing us to be creative in our own community. When we are building the community, you know, it's for the future. Doug Miles isn't just skate rad and skate cool. Doug Miles is living and working and skating in his own communities. With every grind, Doug Jr. is carving a path for the next generation to follow. I think that when you can see someone doing something in the same place as you, you kind of have a little more hope and say, hey, I can do this too. Um, this is possible for me. When you can walk in through the door first, you can open the door, people can follow you through. Still ahead, the inspiring story of a man who went from hardship to business success. We're back right after this.
Welcome back to The Boost. Chris Montana owns the first black-owned distillery in the United States, building his business in the same neighborhood where he grew up as a homeless teen. NBC's Kathy Park sat down with the trailblazing entrepreneur. Chris Montana hasn't been back to his former high school in more than a decade. He just feels very much like a son to me that I didn't have. Louise Borman, also known as Frida, this has to be Pippin. was his former theater teacher. Now, just a mile down the road in South Minneapolis sits Denord Social Spirits, the first black-owned distillery in the country that Chris started with his wife. Why here? I used to walk past this space on my way to high school. And as a kid, I didn't have any concept of being a business owner. Chris's mom struggled. And soon, he was out on his own. I didn't have a, a, a home per se, but I was just couch surfing and, you know, sleeping in folks' basements. Things turned around, starting with the support of a friend's family. They said, well, why don't you stay here for a few weeks? And then a few weeks became, why don't you stay here, like, through the year, through high school? And then I was formally adopted. He would go on to pursue a career in politics and law, but had a passion for brewing beer. So how does distilling come into the picture? I had half of the equation with brewing, and then the other half, I had a lot of help learning on the distilling side. He soaked up the knowledge, learned the science, and built a groundbreaking business in an industry where very few people looked like him. In 2015, I went to my first distillers conference, walked in, I was the only black guy in the room. Today, roughly 50% of Denord staff are people of color. I look for good people first, and then we build those good people. An approach that came into greater focus when George Floyd was murdered just blocks away. It's not pretty to look at, but it's, it's our turning point. During the unrest, part of the warehouse went up in flames, but a renewed mission rose from the ashes. We see ourselves as part of social change. Philanthropy became the fuel to heal a community. Right next door, a food bank, which evolved into a foundation that fosters diverse entrepreneurship. I want to prove the business model. If you as a company invest in your community in a way that may not make you any money, that it will come back to you. Delta Airlines even taking notice, selling Denord 35,000 feet in the air. Did you ever catch a flight and order one of your drinks? Absolutely. <laughs> and for people like Frida, who helped him take flight, a spirit named after her. You were a huge influence in my life and at a time when I absolutely needed, I needed a Frida <laughs> and you were there. I mean, things could have taken a much different direction. Oh yes, he's aware of that. He made very good choices for somebody who didn't have options. I had someone ask me uh, the other day, do you feel like you're a self-made man? And the answer is absolutely not. I was pulled out of a number of situations by people around me. I'm in a better place, but I know what got me here. For today, Kathy Park, Minneapolis, Minnesota. Now to a story down in Glenville, Georgia where a special boutique is ensuring every child in its small town feels loved. Take a look. With the population fewer than 5,000, Glenville, Georgia isn't typically making national news. But that all changed when Linda Durrance opened the doors to a new store. Blossom is a free boutique for fostered, adopted, and less fortunate children. And while the store opened in February, the idea for Blossom was planted many years prior. In December of 2016, we lost our oldest daughter in a car wreck. After she died, 
we made up our minds that we would love without conditions. A year later, the Durances met a trio of foster sisters attending their church. My girls came to me and was like, Mama, Daddy, y'all got to do something. They're going to be separated. So Mark and I told them we would pray about it. And a few weeks later, 13-year-old Juanita and 17-year-old Princessa moved in with the Durrance family on a trial basis. They came with a black trash bag that maybe was a quarter of the way full with clothes that didn't fit them. I just felt empty, like I wasn't worth anything. Just feeling empty with like a trash bag and not like feeling like we're worth it, you know? So the first thing that we did is we went shopping because while they were with us, they were not gonna feel like they were less than. I had a glow on my face because I never really been into a store and like got what I wanted, you know? It just felt really good to experience that. Before long, Linda and Mark were considering what life might look like if the girls stayed permanently. He looked at me, he said, baby, I knew the day they walked in this house that they were not going to be leaving. In May 2019, Linda and Mark officially adopted Princessa and Juanita. I'm just very grateful. I mean, just having a mom here and having a real dad that cares about us. My whole life I always dreamed of being loved and I never thought that that moment would come true. <laughs> and they make sure to kiss us goodnight and give us hugs every night before we go to sleep. And it makes me very happy. And while their older sister Chelsea had aged out of the foster care system, she too became an official part of the family. I was older, but I still needed love. No matter how old you are, no matter what age you are, you need that love. But even with a full house, Linda could not keep one image out of her mind. The Lord kept the trash bag in my heart. Blossom began in my heart then. So in February 2022, the Durances opened up Blossom, a nonprofit donor based boutique where kids in need can shop for free clothes. Hello, this is Princess. Thank you for calling Blossom. Blossom Boutique provides seven full sets of clothing every quarter. The age range is from infant through high school and even college if it's necessary. We didn't have a lot of clothes when we were growing up. Just having clothes on your body makes you feel like a person. Last week, this girl came in. She was um, in foster care too, and she had this biggest smile on her face. And she was just like running everywhere, like getting stuff that she wanted. And I was like, it blessed my heart that we can do that for other people when we didn't get that treatment until we got adopted, you know? Do a five teeth. Can I go five teeth? Here at Blossom, we provide more than clothing. We provide a hug. We provide a smile. We develop relationships with people that come in here. Oh, look at that, that's so cute. Look at that. If there is anybody out there that is thinking about coming in but think they may be judged or treated any type of way, don't feel that way. When you walk in this door, they just treat you just like themselves, like a human being. With Blossom, the Durances plan to continue making an impact by serving as an inspiration to others. If God can plant Blossom in this small little town in Glenville with two traffic lights, I hope people all over the world plant their own version of Blossom to take care of these kids. Stick around, we've got another story you do not want to miss coming up right after this.
after the boost, here is one last feel-good story for you. Take a look. Let's dive into the numbers, the parade numbers. To bring it all to life, it takes more than 8,000 hours of labor from the remarkable Parade Studio crew, 5,000 volunteers, 4,500 colorful costumes, and for the glitz and glam, a whopping 2,000 gallons of paint, wow. 300 pounds of glitter, That's a lot of glitter, and 200 pounds of confetti. And for what you'll see along the parade route, 26 floats, 16 giant character balloons, 12 outstanding marching bands, including all the way from Lubbock, Texas, the Texas Tech University oh, wow, going right band oh, from right. All right. We're so happy that you joined us here on The Boost. We are going to keep that gratitude going all week long here, and we will see you right back here tomorrow on Today All Day. Good morning. Welcome to today. Every day. We are adding to the star power in our studio. The biggest names only on today. See, we're coming in this early, right? Everybody, it's today. Like I won the lottery. How do you feel at this age, this stage? Liberating. We're just getting started, folks. Ain't no stop with us now. <laughs> the boys are back in town. The boys are back in town. It's a miracle. It's a miracle. This has been fantastic. Everything and everyone you're talking about. Only on today. Hello and welcome to Health and Wellness Today. I'm Chanel Jones. As the end of the year rolls around, it's easy to get caught up in the hustle and bustle of the holiday season. But don't let your health take a back seat. On this episode, we'll break down the latest health news, including a new study that suggests hitting the snooze button might actually be good for your health. Plus, we'll reveal simple ways to build healthy habits. And later, how to prepare for a doctor's appointment so you can get the most out of your visit. That's all coming up. But first, we'll begin with some important news from the American Heart Association. According to the latest research, one in three adults has three or more risk factors that contribute to cardiovascular disease, kidney disease, and or metabolic disorders. The condition is called CKM syndrome. And NBC News medical contributor Dr. Natalie Azar walked us through everything we need to know. Dr. Azar, always good to have you. I had not heard of this un until now. CKM, what is that? Yeah, so it is, it's important to remember that the conditions that make up CKM syndrome are not new. It stands okay. for cardiovascular disease, kidney disease, and metabolic diseases or syndromes. And what's encompassed, Craig, in the metabolic is stuff that we have known increases the risk for heart disease for years. We're talking type 2 diabetes, okay. obesity, things like that that fall under that sort of label. But what, what has happened here with the AHA in defining this syndrome is that they're really wanting to sort of reset the framework of how people think about cardiovascular disease risk, okay. prevention, and management. And they've done so, they've made it sort of easy for us because they've stratified CKM into four stages. So let's talk, zero about, to let's four. talk about these yeah. stages so we know what to be aware of, these four yeah. stages. So stage zero is where we hope to all be. That means you have no cardiovascular or kidney or metabolic risk factors. And in this group, Craig, what you're doing is all the lifestyle things diet, exercise, no smoking, all of that kind of stuff. In stage one, however, you might already have some excess fat or some excess fat, especially in the belly mm -hmm. area, or you might have prediabetes. We're also talking here about lifestyle interventions, losing 5% of your weight loss, for example. Now in stage two, we're starting to have those metabolic risk factors, high blood pressure, type two diabetes, maybe you have some kidney disease here. This is where, and this is why it's so important, this is where we can really intervene, and we want to start intervening with medications. For yeah. example, Ozempic, Wigovi, different medications to prevent progression of the kidney disease. And then stage three, we have asymptomatic heart disease. That means you've already have established heart disease. Maybe you're also on a statin. And then stage four, where you actually have symptomatic heart disease with or without kidney failure. It's a lot, and there's a lot in there, and I really want to reinforce to people listening yeah. and also to providers like myself 
This is actually a, a sort of guidance and a framework that we can all look and say, mm, where do I fit along here? Yeah. Where do my patients fit along here? The point is to not progress. The point is to regress. That if you're in stage three or two or one, you want to go backwards, not forwards. And I understand there's also this, this risk calculator now yes. that's also being unveiled and, as well. And this is the, a new component. So the old risk calculator was used to predict a 10-year probability of a heart attack or stroke in people between the ages of 40 and 75. Now the risk calculator is going to start for people at age 30. It's going to predict a 10-year and a 30-year probability for having either a heart attack, a stroke, or congestive heart failure. Whoa. And the best thing about the new calculator, Craig, is that it is going to incorporate these new kidney numbers, diabetes numbers, and also what we refer to as the social determinants of health, right? Because think about people who don't have access to a gym or ah. don't have access to good nutrition, and they really stress the collaboration amongst specialists in sort of this more coordinated care for people. So again, not, not a new disease, just a different way to think about cardiovascular disease in the syndrome of all these factors that actually interplay with one another. Dr. Azar, thank you. It was a lot. I just learned, I just learned a lot, too, <laughs> so thank you. Thank you very much. Now to another new study. The Journal of Sleep Research states 69% of people admit to hitting the snooze button in the mornings. But did you know it might actually be good for you? Sleep expert Dr. Carol Ash recently joined Savannah and Hoda to explain the potential benefits. Dr. Mm -hmm. Ash, good morning. You know yeah. you have a couple skeptics here. Yeah. Yeah. But go ahead, <laughs> say your piece why snoozing is good for you. Well, it all depends on how you're built. And that okay. is, are you a night owl or morning lark? And if you're a night owl, you're more likely to hit that snooze button. And right. that's because night owls will wake up in, in the deeper stages of sleep when the alarm first goes off. And when they wake up, they're more likely to be disoriented and have impairment in their mood and performance. Mm -hmm. So we'll hit the snooze button, the night owls. I feel like whenever I hit the snooze button and I think I'm getting 10 extra minutes, I actually wake up and feel much worse. Mm -hmm. I feel groggier, I feel more out of it. I always say to myself, put your feet on the floor, put your feet on the floor when the alarm goes yeah. off. There is something to that. There is, and that's what the study showed. As you noted, 69% of us are hitting the snooze button. And what happens is if you're that night owl, you're waking up in those deeper stages of sleep and you have what we call sleep inertia. That's that disorientation mm -hmm. and the, the mood impairment and the performance. But what the study showed is when you hit the snooze button, you actually wake up and have improved cognitive performance or better thinking, but your mood, you're still miserable and you're still drowsy. <laughs> And you hate yourself for press and snooze. And now you're late. Now you're late. So, but just to be clear, so if you are a night owl, yes. the study is showing that if you hit the snooze button, that 10 extra minutes of sleep does help you to a certain extent. Yes, mm -hmm. because okay. it takes you out of that deeper sleep into okay. lighter stages and you mm -hmm. wake up without sleep inertia. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, and if you are an early morning person, if you're not a night owl. Yes, well, so th if your physiology, mm -hmm. if you're a night owl, but also for some of us, we're mm -hmm. sleep deprived and we have sleep disorders. So if, if you're not doing what you need to do to, to really have the best sleep hygiene, maintaining the, the environment for sleep, the cool, the dark, and the quiet environment, then you're also likely to be hitting that snooze button and <laughs> waking up with all the problems that the same as a night owl. Just curious, like how do you know, other than just instinct, if you're a night owl or a morning yeah, person? What your normal well, rhythm is. You, most of us, if you are a night owl or a morning lark, the night owls tend to be more alert towards the evening hours. They like to exercise in the evening hours, mm -hmm. and the reverse would be true for the morning mm -hmm. lark. The research says go away for two weeks and see what your sleep preferences are, and none of us really have time to no. do that, right? So you have to pay attention to throughout the day where you feel okay. more alert. Okay. I'm a lark. What about you? I'm a definitely <laughs> lark. We're lark. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Ash. We You're appreciate very it. Welcome. Team Lark. Up next, Maria Shriver's exclusive interview with the man behind the wildly popular Hugh Berman Lab podcast and the six things he says are key to living a healthier life. And later, we'll share simple tips to help women build healthy habits. We'll be right back.
We are back with more help and wellness today. Andrew Huberman launched his podcast in 2021, and since then, he has been dominating the podcast charts around the globe. In each episode of Huberman Lab, he dives deep into scientific research and brings cutting-edge information about health and wellness to his listeners. NBC's Maria Shriver sat down with Andrew for an exclusive interview and discussed how he's helping people optimize their lives. Welcome to the Huberman Lab podcast, where we discuss science and science-based tools for everyday life. If you don't know who Andrew Huberman is, that won't be the case for long. The 47-year-old Stanford University neuroscientist has gained a huge following nearly overnight after launching his now chart-topping podcast amid the COVID-19 pandemic in 2021. Are you surprised at its success? I am surprised how popular the podcast has become, what alcohol does to your brain and body. His podcast can run as long as three or four hours, tackling what some might consider wonky topics like dopamine and neuroplasticity. Huberman cites dense scientific research, but makes it digestible for his many millions of devoted listeners. It's really about gaining knowledge of how one's body and brain work and then tapping into the components of our brain that are there from birth and that if we tap into can really afford us a better well-being. At the core of his philosophy are what he calls protocols, ways to improve mental and physical health through sunlight exposure, nutrition, exercise, stress control, relationships, and sleep. I think if people paid attention to these five things plus sleep, gosh, I, I'm certain that everyone would feel so much better. Our mental health and physical health exists on a background of all these fundamental things, and we have gotten very far away from paying attention to these fundamental things. It's really alerted me to the fact that people have a deep interest in feeling better and doing better. They seem to stick around for the science, and they end up learning tools that can help their mental health and physical health. So do you think it's that they want to understand themselves, that they want to understand their brain? They want to understand this entire machine. I think people want to understand how they work. Right. I think they start to feel a sense of agency. And once they feel a sense of agency and control, then all the other stuff seems less scary. Some are critical of his mixing of business and science. His podcasts are supported by ads for supplements and products he endorses. But Huberman says his goal is to give the masses access to zero or low cost tools to improve their mental and physical health. What does the research really say? What works the first time and every time? It's not about purchasing anything. <laughs> While Huberman says his audience is divided evenly between men and women, some are crediting him with men increasingly prioritizing their mental and physical health. With men, sometimes the lure has to be a little different. You have to say, hey, this is gonna make you a better negotiator. This is gonna make yeah. you more effective in finding and building a great relationship. It's gonna make you more vigorous. You know, if guys are paying better attention to what they eat, how they exercise, their mental health, certainly, I feel like they and society are just going to benefit. So you think you're changing that for men, that all of a sudden men, perhaps your age and or younger, that it's permissible to talk about their emotional health or their mental health in a way that five years ago it wasn't. I like to think that we are. It's not about becoming more emotional, it's about becoming more functional. One should be able to feel their feelings without their feelings hijacking their behavior or feeling as if you're falling into a pit of despair. They can make choices. Like Andrew mentioned, making good choices is essential to a healthy lifestyle. And our next expert is helping to do just that. NBC News medical contributor Dr. Tara Narula recently stopped by the third hour and offered tips to help women and girls build healthy habits. Dr. Narula, good morning. Good morning. I think it's so important, you know, especially with young girls, to establish habits early. Absolutely. Yes, I have two young girls, 11 and 7, so this is personal. Um, and adolescence can be a really tough time for a lot of young women, but it's also a time to lay that foundation for healthy habits that are going to make you a healthy and adult. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the first thing to remember, and this is right in my area, is that cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of death for women. So how do we start those healthy habits early? Well, first of all, exercise we all know is important. So young girls should be getting about 60 minutes of cardio on a daily basis and can mm -hmm. work in some muscle 
Bone Strength Training. Oh, wow. Yeah. So uh, how young are we talking? At what age? Yeah. We're starting like young, like five, six. I mean, you mm. should be getting your kids out there and doing activities um, and, you know, have them walk instead of being pushed in the stroller mm. if they can. Mm -hmm. um, also, you want to think about healthy body image. It's a time where a lot of young girls pay attention to that. And so, you know, I'm a cardiologist. My husband's a plastic surgeon. We're very careful about how we talk about that with our daughters. And we focus on a healthy, strong body. And that means a body mass index, a height weight ratio that falls between the fifth, as you can see there, and 85th percentile. That's how we grade it for girls. As adults, we talk about BMI with numbers, like 25 or less is healthy. Right. Um, also about stress habits. You want to talk about mindfulness, meditation, yoga, breathing exercises, and then avoiding substances. We know that tobacco, marijuana, vaping, alcohol, all of these things are important. Most kids will start using tobacco. Uh, most adults who use tobacco started before the age of 18. Mm -hmm. So really healthy habits to set you up for heart success down the road. We know mental health health can affect your physical uh, well-being. Uh, how do we start early on helping our girls manage that stress and from whether it's social media or, or peer pressure as they go forward. Yeah, Alan, it's so important that we talk about this because half of all mental health disorders really start before the age of, eight, of 14. Wow. And many of them go undiagnosed, they fly under the radar and they're undertreated. And so it has to be on our radar as parents, as teachers and peers. And one of the important ways to help is to keep girls connected so they don't feel isolated and lonely. And that can be through peer groups, leadership organizations, finding role models at schools, teachers. Parents need to really pay attention to warning signs. Be plugged into what's going on with your kids. Talk to them. Ask them how they feel. Therapy. I mean, I'm a huge advocate for therapy yeah. for yeah. adults and kids if necessary. Um, and also, we want to think about social media. Right. So, you know, the Surgeon General put out a report. I know he was here yesterday mm -hmm. talking about the dangers of social media. And mm -hmm. so many of our kids are using them. If you use social media as a young kid, studies have shown for more than three hours, you're at a 50 percent increased risk Gosh. for things mm -hmm. like depression and anxiety. You mentioned warning signs. What are some of the warning signs you should be looking so at? So clearly if kids are kind of pulling away, they're they're more isolated, um, they're not engaging in their daily activities, they're sleeping more, they're they're basically losing interest in a lot of things that maybe gave them pleasure. Um, those can be warning signs. But sometimes, it, Al, it's just as easy as sitting down and talking yep. to your kids mm -hmm. um, and letting them know that it's okay to talk about anxiety, that they feel nervous about things or that they feel sad. Real quickly on reproductive health for mm -hmm. young women. At what age are they supposed to to start getting their first well woman visit? That's a great question. And we all think about that first UIN visit as mm -hmm. women. And you know, pap smears are not recommended until 21 or, be, or after. But the American College of OBGYNs actually suggests that girls start to see an OBGYN between the ages of 13 and kind really? of 18. Mm -hmm. And that is really to build that trusted relationship. Ah. It's not about a pap smear or pelvic mm -hmm. exam. It's about talking about menstruation, for example, what's normal, what to do if they have pain. Most girls will start menstruating between 12 and 14. Mm -hmm. To talk about gender issues, safe sexual practices, STDs, one important conversation is around the HPV vaccine. We know that HPV is a preventable, if we treat it with a vaccine, we can prevent oropharyngeal cancer, cervical cancers. 85% um, of us will get infected with HPV. And so the recommendation is that starting at ages 11 to 12, girls can get their first dose, followed six months later with a second dose. If you start after age 15, it's about three doses. But these are really important conversations to have, and a GYN is a safe safe place for a lot of girls to have those conversations that they may not feel comfortable talking to parents about. That's right. Okay. Dr. Narula, that was so helpful. Thank you so much. Thanks. Covered a lot of ground there. Yeah. Thank you, Doc. Now that we've covered women's health, coming up, we're switching gears to men's health and the important numbers to know for all ages. But first, how to make the most out of your doctor's appointments and what you should do before, during, and after your visit. We're back right after this.
Welcome back to Health and Wellness Today. Whether it's an annual checkup or a follow-up, it can be easy to feel rushed during a doctor's visit or feel unsure about the information you were given. But don't worry, Dr. Natalie Azar is back with a step-by-step guide to help you prepare and make the most out of your appointments. So, so what do you recommend before we even get to the doctor? What are some of the things we should do to prep for the visit? There's a couple of things. And I, I know I've said it here before, and I say this to my patients all the time, especially if you're going in for a follow-up appointment. You know, some follow-up appointments are 15 to 20 minutes. Yes. It is not a long time. And by the time you get done talking about your children, you realize that you have like five minutes left, right? So make sure that you that you bring a list of the, the three most important things that you want to discuss. And don't wait until the end. This is what I say to people all the time, especially if it's an important symptom like chest pain, come in right away and say, these are the things I'd like to get through to make sure that you give them enough time. Definitely bring or make sure that you send in your outside medical records. This is important. Not only will it make the appointment much more efficient, but you'll avoid repeating tests that have mm-hmm. always that have already been done. We talk about how extraordinarily expensive medical care is. Would it be helpful to send it ahead of time? Yeah, absolutely. And just make sure the doctor has received it, though, right. and that it can be scanned into the chart, even if it's an outside medical record. Bring your medication, and that includes supplements, things that aren't prescription. A lot of drug interactions can happen with supplements. We talk about that a lot. And the last one is really important depending on where your doctor practices and where you live in the country if you know you're going to need an interpreter to translate make sure that your that the office has that capability or you can bring a family member Mm -hmm. who can speak english or the the language um, that is needed for you that's those are great tips so that's that's all we need to take with us to the appointment appointment. during the appointment what should we be doing so we'll start with the, as I mentioned, obviously bringing somebody with you if you need help with, with, with the language. Bring a family member or a friend, and especially if you're a senior, yes. bring a child with you to help write, take down notes, to make sure that you're truly understanding what the doctor is saying. We welcome that, right? Because we want to make sure that you as a patient are understanding what's going on. Take copious notes, whether it's on your phone, write things down, ask questions immediately if you don't get something. Find out what next steps are and also ask for material. Do you have handouts? Is there a website I can go to? Do you have any brochures, any videos that can accompany or complement what the doctor is saying? And at the very end, just to make sure you've gotten it all, ask the doctor to recap. What are we doing? What's the Mm -hmm. investigation? What's the follow-up? Recap. Okay, so you think you've processed everything, you go home, and then what? The most important thing is to follow the doctor's instructions. But if you do have questions, make sure that you write them down. And this is really important. I would recommend not, every time you think of a question, to reach out to your doctor and ask that question. Take a beat, take a couple, you're laughing, take a couple of days. Ima- I've done that. Oh yeah, I, I can only imagine By how many way, you get. Right? Ask, da, 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 da. Take, yep. take a couple of days, make a list, and then also ask what your doctor's preferred communication is. Mm-hmm. Do they want a phone call? Are you messaging through the electronic medical record? Make a list, and don't be surprised if your doctor says schedule a follow-up to discuss mm-hmm. if the list is lengthy. Track your symptoms and your side effects from your medication, and this is probably one of the most important things. Before, let's say your doctor starts you on a new medication, yeah. you're having side effects. Do not stop abruptly without asking if it's safe to do so. Not all medications can be stopped without a taper, you can speak to us, you can speak to the pharmacist, super, super important. And that's about it. That's oh, all on my list. That was great. You Go checked, it, you checked it off your list. That was a great yes. checklist. Yeah. Yeah. Nice Thanks, Dr. Azar. Thank you so much. Just ahead, we are talking men's health, including how to manage high blood pressure and when to screen for prostate cancer. That's all coming up next on Health and Wellness Today.
We're back with a focus on men's health. November is also known as Movember to raise awareness for men's health and wellness. Here's board certified colorectal and general surgeon, Dr. Cedric McFadden, to break down the key numbers every man should know. All right, so let's start off with numbers that you should go over with your doctor. First up, 120 over 80. Yeah, so most people know this number, right? This is the blood pressure range, and this is characterizing sort of a normal blood pressure. Mm -hmm. Now, blood pressures can range. They can vary based on person to person. They can vary based on age, and also it can vary based on gender. Mm -hmm. Men are more likely to be diagnosed and be found to have high blood pressure. If this number is high, there's some definite things that you can do that can help lower that number. And one of which is reduce the sodium or the salt intake. Mm -hmm. Now, that may be a little bit challenging because salt's in everything. Sure. It's in our seasonings, it's in our sauces, it's in canned vegetables. Here's a little trick. If you are using canned vegetables, take a time to pour the liquid out, mm -hmm. rinse the vegetables. Oh. You can reduce the salt, con salt content by nearly 40 to 50%. Really? What Just about alcohol? Alcohol, reducing alcohol as well, as well as uh, making sure you're having good exercise. In. If you don't, if that doesn't bring your number down, then what? Well, this is a conversation you need to be having with your doctor, and it's not just one reading that's going to diagnose you with hypertension. It's the trend, and if it's not responding to diet, exercise, you may need some medication. Let's yeah. talk about the magic number of 55. Yes. What do men need to know at that number? So this is the age that most men are gonna start screening for prostate cancer. Uh, prostate cancer, depending on the risk, uh, that age may vary. So if you uh, have a family history of prostate cancer or you're African American, you may begin screening probably in the mid 40s. Now this is a protein that's produced normally by the prostate and when elevated, it can indicate prostate cancer, but it doesn't have to be prostate cancer. There are normal things that can cause an elevated PSA such as inflammation in the prostate or BPH. As you get older, that number changes. And so mm -hmm. you may want to talk with your doctor about what does my number mean and does it make sense for me with my age. And are there, there uh, groups that are more prone to this that have to worry about this a little bit more? Yeah, so that's the group that's going to start screening sooner. That's African-American men. That's also people who have a family history of prostate cancer. Okay, thanks. Yes. Uh Thank you. All right. Dr. McFadden, yeah. let's talk about that. Apparently, this is a number we can track ourselves. We're talking yes. about yes. 150. What's the significance of that number? So this is the number of minutes per week that you need to be getting moderate to intense exercise okay. per week. And, you know, men, uh, you know, one out of three men in the U.S. are overweight, and this can really help reduce that. It seems like a lot, but if you break it apart, that's about 30 minutes, five days a week. Now, this is moderate intense. So this is activity that when you're doing it, mm -hmm. you're doing it so much that you can talk, but maybe you can't sing. Right, so this is. He can't you know, sing anyway. Yes. Wow. But, but he can dance. Oh and even that intense dancing can increase your heart rate. So that's the thing you can do. They also recommend, CC recommends that you get some muscle strengthening exercises at least two days a week and walking. Al's a great proponent of that. We used to say 10,000 steps per day. The recent publication by the European Journal of Preventive Cardiology, they've actually brought it down to at least 4,000 steps mm. per day oh. that can reduce the rate of uh, death or right. reduce the risk of death for any cause, including heart disease. The next number is a range, four to five. What does yes. that mean? So four to five servings of fruit or vegetables a day. Okay. All right, so we have to be very intentional about this. Men don't eat vegetables compared That's to women, true. right? So you have to be intentional about getting a daily serving. Now, How big is a serving? So we're talking an apple. We're talking half a cup yeah, of right. vegetables, all right? Mm. So if you can plan ahead, take an apple in the car, make it a part of what you use as you drive throughout the day. That's great. That's good. And then we put, we put some suggestions on the screen there. Absolutely. Dr. McFadden, thanks as always. Thank you. Thank you. And I appreciate that. Helpful. Appreciate your kind words about the dancing as well. <laughs> <laughs> that wraps up another episode of Health and Wellness Today. Thank you for tuning in. We'll see you next time on Today All Day. Walmart.
Welcome to the Today All Day Kitchen. We're turning everyday leftovers into brand new dishes for the Today Table. With a little imagination and a few fresh ingredients, we'll show you how to make amazing next day dishes. I'm starting off your morning right with a hearty protein packed quiche. And I'll be whipping up the perfect lunch or anytime snack. Crispy rice cakes with the perfect savory toppings. And I'm making a velvety chocolate mousse with a surprising ingredient. Get ready. Because we're clearing out the fridge. And leaving no leftover behind. You can shop the ingredients featured here from our sponsor Walmart by scanning the QR code. Today earns a commission from purchases made through links on today.com. Whenever I'm doing meal prep, I usually end up with a few leftover ingredients. Today, I'm using some leftover rotisserie chicken to make a quiche with spinach, feta, and sun-dried tomatoes. So, let's get started with our crust. I've got some store-bought pie crust right here, and I'm gonna lightly flour my surface. You don't need too much. All the hard work has been done for us. We're just gonna roll out our pie crust. And be really gentle with it because it is pretty fragile. All right, I'm gonna sprinkle the pie crust with a little bit of flour and we are going to roll this out. Just gently enlarge it so that way it'll fit comfortably inside of our pie pan. Okay, I've got this rolled out really nicely. So I'm gonna take my pie pan, I'm just gonna put it right on top of it, just like this. And just take your fingers and lightly go around the edges. I'm telling you, the first time I did this, I felt super accomplished because I'm like, I'm a baker now. I'm, I'm baking. Mama, look at me. And then you're gonna take these edges that are falling over. You're gonna just fold them up under here. So that way you kind of get an even crust. This is the today all day kitchen, right? So we're gonna just make it a little bit fancier. So after I get done doing this, we're gonna add some texture and some form to this pie crust. And all you're gonna do, it's a trick I learned. You're gonna take your finger right up under here and crimp it down, press down and pull it out down and pull it out all the way like this and go all the way around the pie crust. I know the first time I did this I was like yo Kev look at you he's a baking machine and keep going around the edges all right got the last one here all right now look at this it looked like it's from a bake shop right I know I did it myself and you could do it too so with our pie crust ready it is camera ready we're gonna let this rest in the fridge while I prep the rest of the ingredients Next thing we're gonna prep is our spinach. All right, I'm going to set a stainless steel skillet on a medium high heat. In goes a little bit of water. That's all we wanna see. Watch this, boom. In goes the spinach. It's like the Wizard of Oz. It's melting, it's melting. You shouldn't have to cook the spinach for more than one minute. And boom, this is just about right because I don't want it to be completely mushy. I'm gonna take it out. All right, spinach is cooked. Move on to the other star, the sun-dried tomatoes. All right, we're gonna stack our tomatoes together. Just take a knife. And we're just gonna dice them. Look at all this goodness. And they're very fragrant too. Now, moving on to my leftover rotisserie chicken. We're gonna take the skin off of the chicken Peel that back. I know some of y'all are just moaning right now like, <laughs> what are you doing? It's all right, don't worry. There's still a lot of flavor in this dish and you're not gonna miss it. Just going to make sure that there are no bones in here. And you can pull it apart with your hands first, especially if it's cold and left over. If it's warm from just purchasing it, then you may have to use some forks. But I just like to get in there and just use my hands. But of course you do what's most comfortable for you. And try not to do a little bit of this, which I am so guilty of. But you know, a little tasting along the way isn't a bad thing. What home cook doesn't nibble and taste along the way? That's how you know it's good. Let's move on with the recipe. Next part that we have to do, we've got to prep our eggs. So I'm gonna be using some whole eggs. If you are team lean and mean and you wanna wonderful, delicious egg white quiche. Mmm, can't wait to wake up to that on the weekend. <laughs> I'm kidding, I eat egg white. But for this one, 
my leftovers deserve whole eggs. Extra protein, a little extra fat, a little extra love. That's all I'm saying. Add in a little bit of milk. Whisk this up, and we're gonna season it with a little bit of sea salt and pepper for the culture. Boom, salt, pepper. The internet will let you know if you cook unseasoned food right away. And I'm pretty sure our today all day kitchen fam is no different. <laughs> there we go. Now it is time to bring together our beautiful quiche. I'm gonna add in our chicken. Just spread it out. This is gonna be a really meaty protein pack quiche. And you wanna spread it out very well on the pie crust to make sure that every slice gets a little bit of that protein. There we go. Adding in some of our sun-dried tomatoes. Sprinkle those around as well. In goes the spinach. There we go. Our last bit of a protein boost and flavor boost. The feta just kind of crumble it up. I bought this crumble, but if you want to buy the entire block, just use a fork to crumble it up on a plate and then do it. There we go. Now let's give this one more whisk and we're gonna pour in our egg. Watch the slow pour. Getting a little bit more, just some texture on top. Quack pepper. Boom. Look at this beauty. It looks amazing before we've even baked it. This is what we want. We're gonna bake this beauty for about 45 minutes at 350 or until the center is set. I've let this cool for about 15 minutes. It's still really warm, so it's perfect. You can see when I move it, there's no movement there. Let's dig in. I'm gonna give myself a nice, generous portion of this. Oh my gosh, and look how creamy it is. Look at it. The heat has just made that feta just even creamier. I can't wait to dig in. Self-control and portion control is gonna be hard with this one, so don't write me and complain. Kev, I ate the whole thing. <laughs> I understand. Mmm, mmm. I guarantee you, your friends, your family will love this. Whenever I order takeout, I usually have a ton of rice left over. You could always just reheat and eat what you've got, but I love making crispy rice cakes. So many different cultures have their own version of crispy rice, and now it is all over TikTok, so I cannot wait to show you mine. We are going to start with our rice, and I have three cups right here. So we're gonna add a couple other things to it to boost its flavor and also make sure that it all sticks together and doesn't fall apart when frying. So what we want to do is we just want to take some cornstarch right here and we are going to add in a little bit of water and then we're actually going to add in some lemon. We're just going to whisk it on up into a slurry. It smells fabulous, super fragrant. 
We are going to pour it over the top of the rice. I'm also going to season it with some kosher salt. A nice little three finger pinch. And then we are just going to fold it all together. Here I have an eight by eight square baking dish and I have lined it with some plastic wrap. So we're just going to take that rice, pop it directly into the pan and with our fingers, which I find clean hands can honestly be the best tools in the kitchen, we are going to just press that rice down into the corners of the pan. Looking good. It is always so much fun to take leftovers and turn them into something new and awesome. I think that a lot of people don't realize the beauty of half of the work already being done for you. We're going to freeze it for at least one hour, up to two hours. And while that's freezing, I'm gonna get some of my toppings ready. I love topping my rice cakes with the perfect soft boiled egg. So I'm gonna show you how to make the perfect one, my little tips and tricks to do it. First thing you wanna do, boil some water. I am going to take a spider, you could also take a slotted spoon, and delicately lower those eggs one by one into the boiling water. While those eggs are going, let's get to work on our lemony scallion yogurt sauce. Starting off, I have two cleaned scallions right here. What we're going to do is we're going to trim off the root of those scallions, and then we will slice them on an angle, also known as a bias, into really thin rounds. So we'll just take that, pop it directly into the sauce, and then we are going to take that lemon half that we have from earlier, squeeze all that juice right into the yogurt, and then we're gonna hit it with a little bit of salt to awaken its flavor. So we're gonna mix this up, and there you go. We have our yogurt sauce. And it almost looks like a looser version of scallion cream cheese. Our eggs are done. We are going to strain them and immediately transfer them into our ice bath. And what the ice bath is gonna do is it's going to shock the eggs and immediately stop them from continuing to cook. Another thing that I love about an ice bath is as that egg cools, what's going to happen is the white is going to slowly pull back from the shell, creating a really thin layer that will allow us to peel these eggs beautifully. Okay, our eggs have been chilling out and it is time to crack them. So what I'll do is I'll take the egg and I will tap it on a flat surface to break up that shell. And then here's my trusty sidekick. Say hello to the spoon. We wanna make sure that the spoon goes underneath that coating. And the spoon is going to do a gorgeous job of lifting that shell right off. Wow. How satisfying is that? I mean, come on, you guys, take a look at that. Absolutely perfect soft boiled egg. Our rice is nice and frozen and it is time to fry them up. So we're going to start by adding avocado oil to our skillet. We are going to heat this up until it is shimmering. And while we're waiting for that to heat up, let's slice up our rice. We're going to take that overhang that we have and delicately lift the rice block Look at how great that looks. Pull it back. And then what I like to do to make sure that we have even squares is I like to slice off about a half of an inch off of the sides of the rice. And you really wanna make sure that you're using a sharp knife here. Fabulous. Take this, compost it. And then we are going to cut these into nine even pieces, about two inches by two inches. We are going to crisp these up for about five minutes per side until we get a nice golden brown crust on the exterior. Set your timers. 
These are looking really good, and now it is time to flip. Ooh, gorgeous golden. We love to see that. These are looking beautiful. We're gonna transfer them to a wire rack lined baking sheet. And we wanna salt these rice cakes while they are still hot so that they can hold on to the salt that hits them. Okay, I'm going to fry up this next batch and then it will be the moment we're all waiting for, topping the rice cakes and eating them. You can top these any way you like, but I'm gonna show you my favorite way to serve these crispy rice cakes. We'll start with our beautiful avocado. Whenever I'm picking an avocado, I always wanna make sure that when I press down, it has a little bit of give. Another great way to test is I'll look at the top of the avocado where the stem is. If you pull the stem out and you see that the inside is a nice bright green color, that is how you know the avocado is perfectly ripe. So we are going to take a sharp knife we will insert it into the top of the avocado until you hit the pit. And then delicately roll the avocado around, slicing through to cut it in half. Look at that, absolutely gorgeous. As far as peeling the avocado is concerned, instead of scooping it out with a spoon, I love to peel the skin off with my fingers. And then we are going to take the avocado and with the tip of our knife, we will slice into thin strips. I just really love how fancy it looks when you slice it. I think adding a nice, punchy, bright element with a lemon wedge is an awesome way to just give a little extra oomph to your overall presentation. Next up, we have our eggs. This is a really fun trick that I love to use when I am serving these eggs on our crispy rice. You're gonna take your egg. If you want, you can dunk it in a little bit of water or you could even just roll it in that residual lemon just to get it slightly wet. And then what you're going to do is you're gonna take that seasoning and you're going to roll the egg into the Everything Bagel seasoning. I'm a big fan of Everything Bagel seasoning, huge fan. And once this is nicely seasoned, you'll take your sharp knife and slice right through, revealing that perfect jammy yolk. Are you kidding me? I mean, how stunning is that? That is incredibly satisfying. So let's bring back one of our crispy rice pieces. This one has that avocado on it. And for this one, some of our pastrami smoked salmon. I love pastrami smoked salmon, so it's just your traditional smoked salmon, except it has pastrami spice on it. Now I'm gonna plate these up and make them even more gorgeous with our sauce. And what I like to do is just create a really beautiful swoosh on the bottom of the platter and just spread it into a really beautiful layer. Now it is time to adorn our platter with our crispy rice. So remember those green scallion tops that we saved earlier? We are going to take them and just sprinkle them over the tops just for a little extra jewelry and flavor. Okay, I can't contain myself. I have to try one of these. I'm gonna take a little lemon, squeeze it over the top. Let's give it a taste. Okay, first of all, you hear that crunch? That is stunning. I just have to say that this is one reason why you should never toss out your leftover rice. I promise you, you can always put it to good use.
When I first went vegan, I thought I'd had to give up chocolate desserts for good, since so many dessert recipes include dairy or eggs. But now, my day isn't complete without something chocolatey and sweet. It didn't take long for me to discover the magic of aquafaba. What is that, you ask? Well, it's the leftover ingredient that's the key to my fluffy chocolate mousse. And it's actually found in a can of chickpeas. But before we get to that, let's start melting some chocolate. So I have my chocolate here over a double boiler, so let's turn on the heat. We wanna set this to a slow simmer. And there's all different varieties of vegan chocolate. I'm using mini chips, but they also have chunks, they have big chips, and it also comes in whole bars. I like the mini chips because they melt quickly, they're easy to work with, and I just wanna get my mousse done quickly, so why not go the easy route? Our water is at a slow, gentle simmer, so our chocolate is gonna start melting. You wanna make sure to continuously stir it so then that the heat can be distributed throughout the chocolate and it'll melt evenly. Okay, so once all the chips are melted, our next ingredient for our mousse base is some vegan sweetened condensed milk. This is made entirely from coconut and it is so good, it's gonna add a nice creamy base and really thicken up that chocolate and kind of make it a ganache consistency. Now, you can flavor this however you'd like, but I like mine a little bit luxurious and indulgent, so we're gonna give this an amaretto flavor. So it's gonna be a bit of almond, a bit of vanilla. It's gonna taste like Italy. So to this, we're gonna add one ounce of amaretto liquor. Once the liquor is incorporated, we're gonna add in two flavorings, a splash of vanilla and a splash of almond. Almond extract smells so good, but a little goes a long way. It's very strong, so make sure to just add a tiny splash because otherwise it'll become too bitter and overwhelm the whole dish. And it should look like this, glossy and thick almost like the consistency of a ganache. So this looks great, so I'm gonna remove it from the heat and let it cool completely. So while our chocolate cools, we can work on our secret ingredient, our aquafaba. So aquafaba may sound fancy, but all it is is the water from a can of chickpeas. Instead of tossing this, which most people do, if you whip aquafaba up, it turns into a consistency almost of an egg white or like a meringue. You can use it in all different ways. The way I would think about aquafaba is the same as egg whites. So if you were to use egg whites in a dish or even whipped cream, you can substitute it with aquafaba. I recommend getting a can of low sodium or no salt added chickpeas. That way the water doesn't affect the flavor of what you're making. So what we wanna do is to our stand mixer fitted with the whip attachment, we want to make sure that our bowl is chilled. So right before I whip up my aquafaba, I like to keep my bowl in the fridge for at least 10 to 15 minutes so it gets ice cold. And the reason why we wanna do that is because it'll then help us whip up the aquafaba so it turns into stiff peaks. If it's too warm, then it's not gonna whip up and it's just gonna fall flat. So lock in your mixer and we're gonna set it to high. So I'm gonna stop the mixer because I wanna add a little bit of cream of tartar. This is gonna help stiffen up the peaks and get us that nice, glossy, stiff peak that we're looking for in a chocolate mousse. So let's go ahead and add that in and turn on mixer back on high. Let's give it another minute or two to get it real stiff because the stiffer it is, the more delicate and airy our mousse is gonna be. Okay, our aquafaba is looking good. Yep, this is exactly what we want. A stiff peak, it doesn't fall. So now we want to fold our aquafaba into our melted chocolate that's been cooled. We start with a little bit and you gently fold it in. If I just sat here and stirred it, it would turn into a soup and it would not set into a mousse. So we wanna make sure we're adding in as much air as possible. 
So I keep folding until I don't see any more streaks and then I go in with some more dollops of aquafaba. Okay, this looks beautiful. So we're ready for our next dollop. This is looking great, it's all an even color. So now I just have to get into little jars so it can set in the fridge. So I'm gonna clear up my area so I can do that. So we're gonna pour this in here and set it in the fridge overnight. So our mousse have set overnight and they look beautiful. You can see they're perfectly set. There's no liquid. You can see all the beautiful air bubbles. It does not look vegan, let me tell you. I'm garnishing these with fresh cherries, but you can easily use a jarred cherry like an amarena, which will go really well with this. Okay, now I think it's fair to say that I have been waiting way too long to actually dig into this. So why don't we go for a taste? Can you believe this texture? This is made from chickpea water. No egg whites, no dairy, chickpea water. All right, you ready? Wow. It's so airy, yet so decadent. I hope this inspires you guys to cook low waste and zero waste recipes at home and try this mousse. But for now, I'm gonna keep enjoying and indulging. Mm. Good morning, guys. Welcome to The Boost. The holiday season's here, and today we're going to start with a sweet story to warm your heart. Harry Smith paid a visit to the picturesque small town of Springfield, New York, where a very special ice skating rink is bringing the community together. Take a look. In these days when it feels like there's more going on that pulls us apart than that which draws us together. We present this contradiction, the brand new ice rink in Springfield, New York. I mean, it's just crazy. It's like this every day here. Galen Cricky is the town supervisor. The day we visited, wind chill was six below zero. And this kind of weather, people out here shoveling away and people donating skates. We have 50 pairs of skates and they're all donated. Kids, adults, beginners, all are welcome. And by the looks of it, all are darn happy to be here. How big of a plus has this been for your town? Oh gosh, huge, huge, very big. There's not a lot to do here in the winter. Maggie Picorni teaches middle school and comes here often to unwind. People come and want to get out, you know, after work, after school, get some fresh air. It's a great place to be. It sure looked great to us. And how we wondered did this come to be? A $5,000 budget and a vision. I thought about it for two weeks and it kept nagging at me and nagging at me. And I was nervous because I knew it was going to be a lot of work. But when you have an idea that strong, you can't ignore it. 
the frozen equivalent of Field of Dreams, says Ashley Sikama, who runs the parks here. When we built it, we started saying, if you build it, they will come. And they came. <laughs> and they keep coming more and more every day. Built in large part by town folk, ultra-capable Amish neighbors who already had ranks of their own. Out of respect for the Amish, we blurred some images. None of them would take any payment. The town offered to pay them, and they wouldn't take any payment. And Amish men, Wayne Stutzman, who led the effort, even came up with a backyard version of a Zamboni to keep the ice smooth. Normally, we're out here for at least two, at least. Uh, we're coming up, I think we're coming up on four hours now, so. Uh. Benjamin Munyon and his daughter Bridget are here most every day. How much do you like coming out to the skating rink? I like it a lot. You like it a lot? <laughs> I can tell, because I see no sign in you four hours in of like, it's time to go, Dad. I don't see anybody. You're not tugging on your dad's sleeve. No. But I think we would spend all day out here if we could. It's not fancy, this ice rink, but it seems to function in a way that far exceeds anyone's expectations. When we all get together and we spend time together and we get to know each other and focus on what we have in common, that joy just builds and spreads. Imagine one of these in your town. You know what they say, if you build it. From New York, we now head to Minnesota, where a mill changed its whole business model. They're on a mission to help spread warmth and share love all year round, providing blankets to people who could really use them. Joe Fryer has that story. At Fairbow Mill, a blanket is so much more than a billowing scrap of fabric. Making one is a 22-step process. What is this? That is wool. Wool. Supervisor Rafael Medina showed us how clouds of wool are dyed and dried in industrial-sized machines. So this is a little bigger than the dryers in our houses, right? Definitely. Gradually, they're shaped into strands of strong yarn that are woven into cuddly... I make them fluffy? ...colorful coverings. What do you think when you see the final product coming together? I think it's like a painting. It looks like a painting being made. An elaborate operation that recently added a 23rd step. You see, many of the blankets are now delivered to shelters. Oh, I like the colors. That are helping young people who are experiencing homelessness. For us to be able to just provide even some comfort, it really says a lot about the mill, you know, itself. It gives you even more pride. Definitely, it definitely does. Hi guys, if anyone wants a blanket, you can come over and grab one. Super warm, fun colors. Fairbo Mill calls it spread the warmth. For every single blanket the company sells, one is donated. Thank you, thank you. An entirely new business model that was just launched in September. Every night, I get to tuck both of my two boys into bed to put them under a warm blanket and to know that four million kids in this country tonight will not have that same experience. It's enough to break your heart. And as a company that makes blankets, we felt like we were in a unique position to do something about that. Several donated blankets recently made their way to Youth Link in Minneapolis, which helps young people find long-term housing. Come on, let's get warm. The gifts were warmly received. This is gonna be my new favorite best friend. I'm telling you right now. I'm so grateful, thank y'all for real. But the blankets provide more than warmth. There's greater meaning. It means that they deserve something. They deserve something new, they deserve something meaningful, and they deserve to be loved and cared for. Ferris Bate has never needed love and care more. The 23-year-old did not have a place to stay when he moved from Georgia. Before you found this place here, did you have a place to stay? No, I don't have no place to stay. So where were you, where were you sleeping? Really, I was sleeping in the car. YouthLink helped him find medical care and a place to live. Though a blanket may seem small, Ferris is grateful. Oh, blanket, oh yeah, they're, this was really helpful. The blanket, this is the only thing that we need because it's getting cold. The blanket's something you'll use? Oh yeah, the blanket has really been helpful. You can see my blanket, it's really nice, you know. For Fairbo Mill, this 23rd step is not a temporary campaign. It's a permanent mission now woven into the company's fabric. So when we provide this blanket, is it going to solve homelessness? No. But is it going to provide comfort and warmth to a kid in need? 
The answer is yes, and we've been doing that for 157 years. We hope to be doing that for another 157 years from here on out. We're back on this boost with a once in a lifetime NFL experience. Chanel Jones took a trip to Philly to catch up with the Eagles legendary radio team and see how they use their voices to amplify every jaw dropping catch touchdown and more. It's one of the most important parts of a football game. We're not talking about the players or the coaches. And the kick is go! We're talking about the commentators that amplify every jaw-dropping catch, heartbreaking moment, and historic touchdown. He's going to run. He's in! Touchdown! And one of the best-known commentating duos in the NFL is here in Philadelphia. Merrill Reese and Mike Quick lead the Eagles radio team. You are the longest serving current play-by-play -play caller in the league. Tell me, what keeps you doing this year after year? I love it. I love it. There's nothing in the world I would rather do than be out here broadcasting NFL football and especially the Eagles. Broadcasting with Merrill for 25 years now, Mike was a five-time Pro Bowler with the Eagles. Mike, how natural was it for you to go from playing football to being in the announcer's booth? I know the game, so that helped a whole lot, but it wasn't a natural thing. I think that one of the toughest things for me was, and still is, is to criticize players. Mm -hmm. And I have to try and do it gingerly because I know what they go through. Merrill and Mike are so beloved in Philly, there's even a beer named after them. And everyone does a Merrill Reese impression, sometimes better than the man himself. They had on the radio show, they had this segment where people were calling in to imitate Merrill Reese, to try and do the best Merrill Reese. And actually, he called in. I, I called and, in. And he didn't win. <laughs> No way. I finished third. <laughs> I, I said I was Joe from Havertown. But impressions are one thing. Actually putting in the work is another. I think they just think, oh, you guys could do this with your eyes closed. <laughs> well, it, it's a little bit different. I mean, there are hours and hours and hours of preparation. It's so chaotic in the booth, but we have to make sure that it's seamless. It comes out like two guys just sitting talking football. He stepped up his head and falls forward, he and he fumbles the football, and the Eagles have it! For some, Merrill's description of the game is more than just a broadcaster's flourish. It's how they visualize football altogether. I received a, a, a very, very nice award from the Association of the Blind. I've had people say, you taught me football. Wow. Because I've never, I was born without sight. And when I hear that, it almost makes me want to oh. cry, and it means yeah. so much. After hearing all about the broadcast, I had to get a tour of the booth where it all happens. That's beautiful. Yeah. So what's the first thing you do when you come in? I look down on the field and I go 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, midfield, 45, 40, 35, 30, 25, 20, 15, 10, 5, touchdown. Just to loosen up my lips. 
<laughs> While in the booth, I got to meet Bill Werndell, Merrill's spotter, who makes sure he doesn't miss a thing happening down on the field. These pins represent who's in the game. If a play develops, say, a Hargrave forces a, a fumble uh, on Aaron Jones, I'll go, this guy forced the fumble, this guy recovers the fumble. You cannot become a fan. You have to concentrate every down. Is that the key? Absolutely. And during the games, Philadelphia sports legend Howard Eskin adds in commentary from the sidelines. I'm their eyes on the field. Sometimes I can hear the coach talk to the officials. And the officials are getting reamed out sometimes. And I'm trying to find out what the problem is that the coach thinks that they screwed up. Before wrapping up my visit with the Eagles radio team, I did have one request for Merrill. So, you know, it's everybody's dream to hear you say their name because you've got the voice. Okay. I'll never play football, but this might be the closest I'll ever How do you want me to say it? I had an idea. The crowd is on its feet. <laughs> now coming out of the tunnel, the MVP <laughs> from Wichita, Kansas, and Northwestern University, Chanel Jones. From the Eagles to the Vikings, Peter Alexander got an inside look at how the NFL's team in Minnesota is dazzling fans and gaining new ones before opening kickoff with their incredible pre-game experience. Want to see the most electric pre-game in pro sports? Head north. The Minnesota Vikings are dazzling fans. Oh, the skull chant and the Gallahorn, there is no better. And gaining new ones. The electricity in the stadium is uh, absolutely amazing. I see it on TV all the time from San Diego. Let's go! Let's go! Let's go! Even before the opening kickoff. It's the best, and I go to away games too, and there is nothing better than this place. <laughs> We headed to Minneapolis to get an inside look at the pregame that was just named the best overall production in all of American sports. We want it to be an incredible experience, not just a football game, but a full experience the whole time we're here. The most obvious of those is this, 18 feet taken straight from Norse mythology, the Gallerhorn. The Gallerhorn is a horn that the Vikings sounded to start a battle, so we thought that it fit really well. This one is sounded by special guests. Like Hall of Famer John Randall. You sounded the yaller horn at the first home playoff game for the Vikings in the new stadium. That moment when you get behind it, what were you thinking? Unbelievable. It gets the crowd roaring. It gets everybody in the right frame of mind. And it's just such an exciting feeling. Even louder is the massive carved drum pounded by a member of the team's Skull Army. When it's the stadium doing the Skull Chant, and we got this drum rocking and this place is going, it's, it's quite incredible to be a, a part of this. And then there's the chant, 66,000 strong. Skull, which basically means cheers in Scandinavian countries, has been a part of Vikings fan culture for decades but it got new intensity once the team paired it with a popular cheer from European soccer. Everybody talked about it, it kind of went viral, and we got 100 emails from fans asking us, like, you've got to do this. The Vikings got the blessing of Iceland's team captain to adopt it. And a new Viking war cry was born. Sports is a, is a communal experience, right? and you, ha you feel something when you're, when you're here in, in stadium for the snow and for the horn and the skull chant, all part of it. That adds to the home field advantage. And the icing on the cake, 55 fake snow machines providing some Minnesota atmosphere even inside their dome. And then the art form is making sure you hit as many people as you can. Local pride has never sounded louder.
to the Boost. Our next story celebrates the life-saving work at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. Two families have something extra special to be thankful for this holiday season. Carrie Sanders has the story. How do you feel? <laughs> Sparrow Chloe is a pint-sized ball of energy. Sparrow, show me with your fingers. How old are you? How old are you, big girl? How many is that? One, two, three. Adorable. A delightful little girl who at only 10 months was changing in ways that only a mother would pick up on. That I started to suspect something was wrong. She had just stopped trying to crawl. She had become super clingy to me. She wouldn't go to her dad. She wouldn't go to her grandmother. She wouldn't play with her brother. And she would just be always just kind of wanting to cuddle. Insistent something was off, Abriana, a self-described helicopter mom, took her daughter to doctor after doctor after doctor, five in all, who each said the bulging eyes, Sparrow's lethargy, it's probably just allergies. When they said it was allergies, I just felt like that was not the gist of it. That was not the sum of what was wrong with her. I knew that it was something more. Her intuition was right. Tests at a local hospital then confirmed little Sparrow had cancer. It was gut-wrenching when it finally sank in. And I mean, it was just moments after the doctor came in and said, we suspect this leukemia. You guys are going to St. Jude the day after tomorrow. When St. Jude first opened its doors, Sparrow would have had a 4% chance at survival. But today, 94% of children at St. Jude survive this type of leukemia. You love me. But the journey you is never me. easy. And for every family facing leukemia, it's all consuming, as the Owens family also discovered. Brecken, Shadow Owens, he uh, is four. <laughs> And then this oh, is Val, Catherine Owen, and she's, two. and she's two. When Breck was just under two years old, he was diagnosed with the same type of leukemia as Sparrow. Just 48 hours before, we just thought it was a fever, and now you're using the word cancer to our little boy. It was overwhelming. We had no idea what the outcome would be. We were scared of- Scared and hurting. There's no pain like kid pain whether it's a, a scrape on his knee or, or a fever or, or cancer. It's just a gut-wrenching feeling when you can't make it better. For Sparrow and Breck, doctors prescribed chemo. For Sparrow, it lasted two years. For Breck, two and a half years. For both, it recently ended, which makes this Thanksgiving ever so meaningful. What do you want to be when you grow up? A superhero doctor chef. I think you already are a superhero. To the doctors and to the staff at St. Jude, the Clough family would like to thank you for the part that you've played in saving our daughter's life. We're truly appreciative. There's not anything that we can do to repay them for giving us our son. Just looking at him, they gave us more than they'll ever even realize. And we are just so grateful this Thanksgiving. From the day children arrive at St. Jude, there's a single goal, the celebratory no more chemo party. But because of COVID, it wasn't the normal celebration. It was different. It's been two and a half years. It's been such a long journey that you yearn for that celebration, just to watch the confetti go down and to not have that. Um, it's heartbreaking. You're on the go line walking in and then we can't celebrate it together. COVID stole the celebration, but with the help of Marlo Thomas. Congratulations, wow. And the staff at St. Jude were making up for it this Thanksgiving. Pack up your bags, get out the door, you don't get chemo anymore. <laughs> for today, Kerry Sanders, NBC News. Oh, yeah. And now the National Outreach Director for St. Jude, Marlo Thomas, joins us. Marlo, um, that song that we just heard there, that No More Chemo song, uh, that, that has a, a special place in your heart. It certainly does. You know, the first time I went to my uh, to St. Jude a after my father had died, and I was kind of afraid to go inside because I was I thought I'd be overwhelmed by all the memories of the times I've been there mm -hmm. with him. So I kind of just sat in the car and cried a little bit. And then finally, I pulled myself together, and mm. I went inside, 
And there was this party going on, these little kids in paper hats and balloons and confetti and a cake and ice cream. And I asked the nurse, whose birthday is it? And she said, oh, it's not a birthday party. It's an off chemo party. Wow. Uh, I really lost it. I, <laughs> these tears came down my face and I thought, you know, my father's spirit is alive and Absolutely. well here. You know, and I knew that I had to be a part of it. It was a real defining moment for me. Mm. When we talk about treatment, and I'm sitting here trying not to cry, I lost a childhood friend to leukemia when I was young, more than 20 years ago. And I think about, you know, if she were alive now, right? And you think about the success rate. I mean, for most common childhood leukemia, I think it's 94% now, right? You think it'll ever reach 100%? You know, it will, because we'll go after it just the way we got through the, to the 94%. Now to an Iron Man who's shown incredible strength, resilience, and grit after a truly unimaginable loss. Peter Alexander is back with that story. When you're training, who are you thinking about? Jillian and Lindsay, always. My training is really my time to remember the happy times. And there were so many happy times, Jillian and Lindsay, not just Zach's sisters, but his best friends. Jillian, she was adventurous, spunky, soulful, but also had this silly, goofy side to her. Lindsay is the epitome of love, would walk into a room and light it up. Just over a year ago, Zach and his family were all together enjoying a summer vacation at a rental home when their world was shattered. In the middle of the night, woke up and uh, the house was on fire. My parents made it out. I made it out of the window in my bedroom, but Jillian and Lindsay didn't make it out. They were just 21 and 19. Is there even a way to describe that level of grief, losing your two sisters? I mean, it is a pain and sadness that is more intense than anything I've ever felt. They were my people, you know, they're the ones that I did life with. Life without them was unimaginable. As Zach describes it, simply putting one foot in front of the other felt impossible. But as time passed, Zach knew to heal, he needed to honor his sisters. How can I do something today that they'd be happy about? I had started to look towards fitness. But fitness alone was not enough. Zach set his sights on completing one of the greatest challenges in sports, the Ironman. A more than two mile swim, 112 mile bike ride with a marathon to cap it off. Did people say you're nuts or did they say that's brilliant? I, I got a little of both. What, what's your, your personal best in the marathon? I was like, I haven't done one of those. So uh, big cyclist, right? I was like, no. Okay, so college swimmer. Yeah, like, no, I don't really know how to swim. Zach teamed up with a coach and spent the next year focused on a Saturday in September, the date of the Ironman Maryland, also his 25th birthday. I'm running this race in honor of Jillian and Lindsay. Go get it. His motivation, their voices. This video, a graduation gift from his sisters that he now cherishes. I have a six minute video of Jillian and Lindsay being themselves on my phone and telling me how much they love me, how proud they are of me. You're our role model and our best friend and we love you so much and we're so, so, so proud of you. That's gonna stay in my heart uh, and be what I'm thinking of the, the entire race. I cannot be more proud to call you my brother. I love you so, so much. And cheering him on, family and friends all decked out in pink, Lindsay's favorite color. 11 hours later, exhaustion and exhilaration. For Zach, more than a race, but a moment to remember.
the Boost. We've got one more story for you, and this one will leave you with a smile. An adorable little girl in Scotland who might have a little work to do when it comes to identifying colors. What color is that? Purple. Is it blue? Mm. Good girl. And what color is that? Purple. Yellow? Yellow. Mm -hmm. And that one? Purple. Is it red? Red. Good girl. What was that one? Purple. White. Uh, pretty soon she's going to be right. Purple is yeah. coming. Uh, I think if she keeps guessing, she's going to be right on. By the way, I love how she's, I don't care what she says, just keeps speaking. That's it for today. We hope we're able to start your day off with a little positivity and a big old smile. We'll see you tomorrow with more of The Boost right here on Today All Day. Do you ever just look around and say, I can't believe we did this? Yes, totally. That was like the light bulb moment. I got up there and I just said I quit my job and started this company. And I just kept going. It was a lot of testing and learning. There's been a lot of tears along the way. We can actually change the world. When did you have the moment, I made it, I did it? Hi everyone and welcome to another edition of She Made It, where we highlight some amazing female founders who are shaking up their industries and turning their light bulb ideas into reality. For this half hour, I'll be telling you all about some of my favorite brands to help you look and feel your best, whether it's a cozy blanket to help us unwind or a unique way for gifting to those you love. We have got you covered. Plus, I'll reveal my She Made It It list, featuring four small businesses you'll want to shop, all from dynamic women you'll want to support. So, let's get started. First up, I want to introduce you to Birdie Lashes, founder Yasmin Maya, an influencer who went from doing makeup tutorials to launching her own beauty brand. And she has overcome some incredible challenges on her path to success. Take a look. Influencer Yasmin Maya has over 3 million followers glued to her makeup and hair tutorials. Hey, my beauties, welcome back to my channel. Bienvenidas a nuevo mi canal. Yo soy At 30 years old, the wife and mom with baby number two on the way. Oh, baby bump. <laughs> is also behind Birdie Lashes, the brand she officially launched last December with foam ink lashes and eyeliner that doubles as adhesive. What makes your lashes so easy? Because I know a lot of people are like, okay, it's another lash and I can't ever put them on myself. Our lashes are vegan, cruelty-free. They're super ultra soft and they're very light. So you're not gonna feel them heavy. You just pop it right on top of the eyeliner and it will stay. How proud are you of yourself? I look back and it's unbelievable. Hi guys. Okay, welcome to my channel. Nine years ago, Yasmin started her YouTube channel, Beauty Bird. She was living alone and in limbo, not in the Southern California town where she was raised, but in her birth country. I'm going actually through a really hard time right now. Walk us through what your childhood was like and what you went through. I was born in Mexico, very poor, like almost homeless. I didn't move here to the United States until I was like a year and three months. I grew up thinking I was part of this country and it wasn't until I got to high school when my mom got deported that it hit me with the reality that I am actually an illegal immigrant. Yasmin's father, also not a U.S. citizen, was deported shortly after her graduation. I started realizing I'm not going to be able to apply for a job or even go to college and get scholarships. I was in fear of deportation. Then at 18, Yasmin boldly left the only place she had called home bound for Tijuana, hoping to find work until she could return without worry. It's not a life, honestly, to just live in fear. My boyfriend went after me and we ended up getting married. But her husband had to patiently wait for her in the States. Even her parents had legally returned to this side of the border. Yasmin was on her own for three years, waiting on her green card. Well, every day I would cry. <laughs> 
So how did you overcome that? Well, I started watching YouTube videos, girls doing makeup, and my mom was like, why don't you give it a try? And I was like, you know what, you're right, I have nothing to lose. Short on cash, Yasmin receives a camera and cosmetics from her mother. But then, she accidentally burned off her lashes while heating hot water for the shower. My little tiny eyelashes. I was so sad and it was like, no, I'm not gonna give up. I went out and bought my first false lashes. Is that incredible? Yeah. Finally, reuniting with her family in May of 2013, she continued to post and rake in ads and sponsorships, and a new dream emerged. I started seeing more and more people saying, I unfortunately don't know how to apply lashes. She decided to develop an affordable false lash line for every eye shape. Whatever fiesta that you can think of, this is for you. Today, with close to 80,000 units of lashes sold and a multi-million dollar portfolio across all of her businesses, Yasmin feels her success as a Mexican Latina immigrant is especially poignant at this time. What I try to do is use my voice for other people that feel like they need to be quiet or ashamed of like where they're coming from. And so I take this month very serious to try and use it to our advantage and just be heard. Any dream is possible. We have some samples here. They're so easy to use. And after our She Made It segment, Yasmin told us that Birdie Lashes saw an incredible boost in sales and website engagement. Most recently, the brand launched their Wing It Mascara. It's their first ever mascara with a custom dual tip, and it's waterproof. Too. We all love that. Yay, birdie lashes. All right, I love this next one too. Catherine Hamm is an entrepreneur who built her Barabi business based on comfort. And today, she's turned her homemade weighted blankets into a multi-million dollar brand. Growing up in Germany, it was normal to nap during the afternoon. And then once I moved here to the US, I realized that actually nobody is napping. I think it's almost frowned upon. Feel like you need a nap? Well, Catherine Ham has you covered. I mean, no one has a master's in blankets. So what was your <laughs> background? I used to be an economist at the World Bank. With the constant traveling, I just felt exhausted, not being able to sleep, waking up multiple times at night. It just really affects you and it affects your day. Back in 2016, Catherine researched products to help her sleep and came across weighted blankets. It was just a complete game changer for me. I slept like never before. The only problem I had with this blanket that it just made me really hot. It was filled with all these plastic beads. So it was noisy and I just realized there was no way that I could sleep under that blanket for an entire night. After getting nearly 50 no's from potential manufacturers, Catherine took matters into her own hands, enlisting her mom to knit her first prototype out of their garage. The blanket was heavy, it looked beautiful, and it felt cozy, calming, and most importantly, it didn't make me hot. So that's when I realized that we had created something really special. She called the business Barabi, a combination of the words bear hug and lullaby. Baraby officially launched online in December 2018 and sold out in two weeks. What was the turning point? Because you turned this into a multi-million dollar business. One morning I woke up and I had an email from West Elm in my inbox and they wanted to see our blankets and come to our New York showroom. And I mean, I almost broke down laughing because we didn't have a showroom at that time. We were just- Right, so, you're like, come to my garage and see my mother and I. I think I did what any entrepreneur would do at this stage. So how about we come to your place? So we borrowed a hotel trolley and we pushed the whole trolley with 300 pounds of blankets down the street to West Elm. And they immediately loved them and they were ready to order. Barabi made over $21 million in revenue in 2020 and recently had a cameo in an iconic TV show. So we just launched in Nordstrom's Countrywide. And if you happen to watch Sex in the City, you might have spotted our blankets on set. Yeah, we've been growing from two people. Wait, 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 uh, whoa, whoa, whoa. You just really <laughs> like blew over that. Tell us the scene, tell us how that happened. Cynthia Nixon has a blanket and she was directing that scene. So it's like a pinch wow. me moment because I'm a huge fan. And as CEO, Catherine is trying to create a dreamy office environment for Barabee's workforce. We work from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. 
And outside of these co-working hours, everyone can be flexible. Some people like to nap, some people like to walk their dogs, and other people like to spend time with their children. I assume that your employees respond well to that, just saying, if you get your work done whenever you can get it done, I want to encourage you to feel rested and healthy and inspire wellness. We don't have to earn rest. We actually need rest. I think it's a, it's it works wonders just to put 20 minutes on the calendar for a nap. For someone sitting at home who has an idea like this and who's not in the field they want to be in or has an idea about something that doesn't exist, what would be your best advice? Every business starts with an idea and it's more about the courage to take the first step doesn't that just make you want to curl up and take a good nap? Well, since Barabee's launch, the company has grown more than 5,000%. And in the spirit of Barabee's mission to create a calmer, more comforted world, this past spring, Barabee launched the Hug It, a sensory knot pillow that provides stylish stress relief. We could all use that. Okay, but don't go to sleep just yet because there's much more to come. Next, supermodel turned mogul Winnie Harlow shares her personal story of building her skincare line, plus how one woman is reinventing the ear piercing experience. We'll be right back. Welcome back to She Made It. Winnie Harlow is a groundbreaking supermodel in her own right. Here's a look how one of the biggest names in fashion took her talents from the runway to the sun care aisle. Take a look. I've been able to showcase everyone else's work, the things that they've labored on, and now I get to do the same for myself. It's a dream come true. For years, Winnie Harlow has been blazing a trail in the fashion industry, but now she's making strides in business as well. After everything you've been through, and I know this goes back to childhood, how important is that title for you, entrepreneur? My mom is a hairdresser and she had her own salon. My dad is a mechanic in Jamaica and still runs his own shop. I was thinking, where do I get this from? And I was just like, wait, it's in my blood, you know? It, it's from my parents. As a child, Winnie was diagnosed with the skin condition, vitiligo. It's hard enough being a kid to begin with, but right. kids were so mean and saying names to you. Tell me about your childhood. When you're in a small town, especially as a young kid, it feels like that is the end all and be all. It seems like the end of the world, but it's really just the beginning of your life. After competing on America's Next Top Model, Winnie started making a name for herself on high fashion runways and at photo shoots for big brands. Walking Victoria's Secret was incredible for me, life-changing. A lot of people don't know this, but I did try out for Victoria's Secret the year before and I didn't get it. And so getting it the second time was amazing. Like any Vogue cover I'm on, I'm the first model with vitiligo to be on that cover. So that is mind-blowing to me because I had never seen myself represented 
going up. Winnie says in 2018, an incident on a set inspired her to take action. I had this horrible experience on set at a shoot where no one wanted me to apply sunscreen. It made my, my skin look purple and gray, and it wasn't great for the photo shoot. So, you know, I went without to get the best shots, but after two days of shooting from sun up to sun down in the Bahamas, I was burnt to a crisp. I was like in so much pain. I had to have doctors give me injections for, for pain, for inflammation. And I realized that there wasn't sun care on the market that made you look gorgeous and also be well protected. Winnie got to work developing skin care. All things just, you know, you just, you get a line and it doesn't work like that. I had no idea where to start. I had the idea, like it's my brain child, but I had no business savvy. I think some of the most challenging things for me were one, hearing all those no's when we were, when we started fundraising, especially being a business that was created in a pandemic where things were already being pushed back with packaging and the formulas and like our factories shutting down for COVID. And, you know, there were so many steps back every time we were taking steps forward. Nearly three years later, Winnie raised $6.5 million from investors to launch K-Skin, a sun care line inspired by the beaches of her family Family's native Jamaica. I wanted to put things that I've used since I was a kid going to Jamaica and staying with my dad. They used to cut the aloe vera plant and rub it directly onto our skin for like mosquito bites or sunburns. We also have hydrating nectar, which is from different fruits and botanicals. Winnie hopes to inspire people to take care of and to love the skin they're in. What would you say as advice to young girls out there who are going through a tough time who just like want to get through it and pursue her dream. I would say focus on yourself. There's only two things that you can really do in life. You can change things. And those things that you can't change, you gotta move forward. Well, after we talked to Winnie for She Made It, the K-Skin team told us that K-Skin sales more than doubled. They've also expanded the line to include non-SPF lip and body care products, just the perfect pampering we need for fall and winter. Congratulations, Winnie. Great, great girl. Well, next up, a woman who is shaking up the piercing business. Rowan founder Louisa Schneider made it a point to create safe, hygienic, and fun piercing experiences for first-timers and those looking to get in on the ear party trend. Do your work, do your research, and don't let anyone make you feel like your idea is small. Because if you're passionate about it and you know that it resonates with other people, you were probably onto something. For entrepreneur Louisa Schneider, First-time ear piercing should not look like this scene from the hit movie Grease. Yeah. Oh. Oh. And I desperately wanted an option that I knew would be safe, but that would also be joyful. And so that was really when I started thinking about why didn't that concept exist already? Louisa launched Rowan in 2018, a company looking to turn this sometimes ignored rite of passage into an experience worthy of a special celebration. To me, as a mom and as a woman, it was so clear that ear piercing is a milestone. And I was amazed that it had not been really modernized. So tell me how this idea started. I knew that even though malls were really suffering, one concept that continued to drive foot traffic was mall-based piercers. And around the time that my daughter was born, I took my nieces to get their ears pierced. And it wasn't a great experience. <laughs> The concept was pretty crowded and cluttered and tired. And I realized at that time that I would never take my daughter there. That's when Louisa started Rowan, a concierge ear piercing and subscription box service where customers could book a licensed nurse to perform piercings in the comfort of their own home. What was your first step? We started with a small proof of concept. So two nurses that were able to do a number of house calls and for us at Rowan, one of the most important things is thinking about the full experience. You may end up with an infection and that is something that we want to avoid. The business quickly grew. Louisa then opened Rowan's first piercing studio in New York City, coincidentally just half a block away from a big box store that would play a major part in the next step of their journey. I got reached out to on LinkedIn and the person who was reaching out to me had a target address. And I did not think it was real. So I actually ignored it for a few weeks. And then there was another persistent outreach. And I thought, well, there is a chance this is real. So I'm going to take the call. 
Target offered Rowan the opportunity to open full-service piercing studios in stores across California. I love it. But the pandemic brought on new challenges for the company. The thought of having an intimate moment piercing an ear during COVID was really uncertain. But as people became more knowledgeable about COVID and about safety protocol, there was this imprint of wanting a sterile environment. Rowan nurses are now in more than 200 Target locations across the country. They've also opened a second standalone piercing studio, this time in Connecticut, and pierce as many as 20,000 ears a month. What do you think getting your ears pierced energetically represents? We say at Rowan, every piercing is a milestone and every milestone can be celebrated with a piercing. It's really a liberating form of self-expression. So doing it safely and having fun is really, you know, what it's all about. After our She Made It show, Rowan tells us they've since opened up nine studios across the country. And this month they are opening a location in Charlotte, North Carolina, and their very first mall location at the Mall of America. And it doesn't stop there. Chicago, Boston, and Miami, look out for a Rowan coming to you. I love hearing that. Well, up next, hear about women who made their dreams a reality from a female founder who is taking gifting to a whole new level and to a woman who's showing us that her business is on a roll. That's all coming up next. Welcome back to our She Made It special focused on pampering and getting ready for the holidays. You're about to meet the entrepreneurs behind innovative companies who are helping us make our lives a little bit easier. First up, Toki founder Jane Park, who is putting a creative spin on gift giving. Take a look. My parents and I immigrated from Korea when I was four. We lived above their convenience store and I did my homework behind the cash register. I loved having a front row seat to their courage and resilience. Even though I went to law school, my passion for New Horizons pulled me into entrepreneurship. I took a leap to start my first business, a beauty tech startup in 2007. I raised millions of dollars and sold it for even more. A few years ago at Christmas, I was throwing out bags and bags of used gift wrap because most of it wasn't recyclable. I thought about how my Korean grandmother would wrap gifts in squares of cloth, which we saved to reuse again and again. So I got to work reinventing gift wrap to make it more sustainable with the digital twist by inventing a QR gift tag, which allows you to show up with your gift by uploading a photo or video. 
Toki means rabbit in Korean. And my hope is that our products will hop from friend to friend and celebration to celebration. Well, since our She Made It segment, Toki is now nationwide. And check this out. This summer, they just launched their latest product line, the Toki Eco Gifting Set. This line uses recycled water bottles to further reduce our emissions. And guess what? With every order of their Eco Gifting Set, Toki is giving viewers free additional bags, all with free shipping. Well, moving on to brand number two now, that's actually the name. Number two, founded by a woman who is wiping away the competition while saving the planet at the same time. Take a look. My name is Samira Farr, and to me, true luxury is living in a land plush with trees rather than cutting them down to make toilet paper. That's why I created Number Two, a stylish toilet paper that not only gives you a clean wipe, but also helps preserve our forests. In 2017, after selling my first business, I began to research the toilet paper industry. It felt outdated. I was shocked to find that TP can be made from alternative fibers like bamboo, and that there aren't a lot of brands that don't use plastic packaging. I also learned that bamboo can grow at a much faster rate than trees, making it a way more eco-friendly option. I launched number two toilet paper in 2019 and have grown from selling only online to selling from bigger home goods stores like Urban Outfitters and Lowe's Home Improvement. Customers love the strength and quality of the teepee, as well as the stylish patterns. But most importantly, they are thrilled to be saving the planet one wipe at a time. Love this. Well, number two is now introducing 100% bamboo paper towels and facial tissue. And they have exciting news. Early next year, number two is now becoming Rizzy Home and will continue to expand Band, its line of home goods. Congratulations to them. I use this and just love the packaging. How else can you give toilet paper as a gift? Well, there's still much more to come. Up next, it's our She Made It It list for women-owned small businesses that will help you feel your best this season. We'll be right back. Welcome back. I have even more extraordinary female founded brands that I'm so excited to share with you on my She Made It It list. Brand number one, Dogwood Hill. In 2014, founder Jennifer Hunt saw a gap in the market for online art-driven holiday cards, so she did something about it. Jennifer's mission was to create a website where customers could go for personalized cards that eliminated the lengthy design times and pricey design fees. So. Dogwood Hill was born. With its collective of over 30 artists, Dogwood Hill is able to supply products within 10 days that are unique and personalized for you and your families. What a great way to wrap a gift and beautiful quality. All right, brand number two, Clean Circle. Lena Chow launched her skincare reusable products that replace single-use makeup wipes and cotton rounds. As the first-generation daughter whose mom worked as a seamstress, Lena knew the ins and outs of the textile industry and set out to create beauty reusables with certified clean fabrics. Clean Circle's mission is to reduce beauty waste 
all while protecting your skin from environmental stressors. These are great. Brand three, Palermo Body. Jessica Morelli is the founder and formulator of the skincare line that is all about nourishing the skin and stimulating the mind. At an early age, Jessica was inspired by the natural skincare practices of her Sicilian grandmother. Their revitalizing body scrub has become a favorite among customers, and just recently, Palermo Body launched their breast cancer initiative, donating $5 of every purchase of the scrub to breast cancer research. Such an unbelievable cause and really, really great products. All right, last up, Lucky 13 Candles. Lawyer and founder Amina Max started her massage oil candle company in 2019 to connect her with her then fiance and now husband. Guess it worked. So she taught herself how to make candles that turn into massage oils with all natural ingredients. Amina reports that the connection with her husband is stronger than ever, and Lucky 13 Candles will be getting into retail stores early next year. Just love this. Well, that's all for our She Made It today. Thanks so much for watching, and remember to shop these small businesses, scan the QR code at the bottom of the screen, or head over to today.com slash shop. I'm Joel Martin. I'm so excited you watched the show. Such great entrepreneurs, and we'll see you next time. And welcome back this morning. We are rounding out Restaurant Week on today with fame, celebrity chef, restaurateur, television host, and all-around great guy. Of course, he also happens to be the mayor of Flavortown. The mayor of Flavortown. That's right. Uh, he is up early for us in Santa Rosa, California, alongside his son, the deputy mayor of Flavortown, uh, Hunter Fieri, also there. Good to see you both. Thanks so much. for. Hey, God, before we start cooking, I, I think folks should know, Last year, you raised, I believe, about $21 million uh, for, for employees of the restaurant industry, the Restaurant Employee Relief Fund last year. First of all, kudos to you. But secondly, do you think we're at a point where some restaurants are starting to get back on their feet? Well, I, one, thank you for recognizing that. And there were so many great people that were involved in raising that money. We got almost to $25 million. Uh, the money kept wow. trickling in there at the end. But the National Restaurant Association was amazing in, in helping that happen. Uh, we gave out 43,000 grants, by the way, Al. But I'll tell you, um, yeah, the restaurant business is we're coming back. We're coming back a little bit different. You know, people are learning a lot more about to go, a lot more about delivery. Um, they're learning to, uh, you know, they're kind of learning how their restaurants are able to work. The, the dining in is, is still a really difficult part. And dining out can't happen all over the country, especially because of weather. But uh, restaurants are coming back. We're resilient. I mean, this, yeah. is, this is what we do in this industry. Hmm. Your new season of Tournament of Champions helps local restaurants. Can you tell us about the impact of that? Well, okay. So Tournament of Champions, in, I, listen, I've done so many different types of shows on the Food Network, and this is really one of my favorites. I designed this about three or four years ago with my buddy Brian Lando. And you know what we said is we want to make a competition that can never be duplicated. Mm -hmm. This randomizer that you see spinning right there, that gives a different protein, a different vegetable, uh, a different piece of equipment, different style of food, and different time for each competition. And these chefs are really put under the – I mean, they're put under the gun. I, I've never seen anything this hard. I mean, and, and I think Iron Chef and all the competitions that have happened before this, uh, but this one right here really puts them to the test. And uh, the new season starts this Sunday on, on the 7th. And wait till you see the chefs and wait till you see what they do. Blow your mind. All right, let's get to this burger. I see you're about to flip it. What is, what is, what is Hunter making over there? What is he stirring up? Well, Hunter's over here working on uh, making a lot of something. Hunter's making, Hunter's making the famous donkey sauce. And we use this by the gallon, of course. No, I don't know why we're making this much. But it's got roasted garlic. It's got a little bit of Worcestershire, mustard, a little salt, a little pepper, a um, little mayonnaise, of course. And this Ooh, really is good. this is our signature burger that we do at Flavortown Kitchen. We do at all the Guy Fieri restaurants. And, of course, we love to make for you guys at 5 a.m. in California. Um, <laughs> but you're, adding, ma you're ma adding mac and cheese to this guy? So, the ma so we've got some macaroni that's done here going into the cheese sauce that we made. We call it Super, Super Melted Cheese, SMC. Mm. Okay, so we'll take this mac and cheese into that. Hunter will go ahead and bring me a couple pieces oh, like of uh, cheddar more, cheese. Yeah. It's more okay. cheese than mac, right, Mr. Mayor? Well, what and we like cheese. to do is, is really accentuate wow. the cheese side of things, yeah. okay? Mm -hmm. We'll throw the uh, dome on top of that, a little water. You want to hit me with a bun, Hunter? Wow. 
I don't know if you see us, dude. These are special yeah. effects, oh. by the way, you guys. This is really yeah. us at it's home. Oh, I thought he was going to actually hit you with a bun. <laughs> no, he oh, would. He trust me. Do don't, don't, don't start. It. He'll get into this. He, <laughs> I made him get up early. He wasn't super thrilled about that idea. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we get a little bit of that. Hunter's toasting the bun. He'll hit it with a little of the uh, donkey sauce. But, yeah, so Tournament of Champions is happening, and I'll tell you, we're coming back. We've been shooting a lot of guys' grocery games, what we call guys' grocery games delivery that we shoot here in this kitchen at our house. And we've also been doing a lot of, uh, of Triple D takeout. So we couldn't go to, a, to our favorite Triple D restaurant because everybody was closed, but the restaurants were still operating with their delivery and their to-go. So we said, hey, why not send us some of those new dishes that you guys are doing, and we'll highlight them. So we started mm -hmm. to highlight these. Uh, Hunter, I think we shot probably 30 shows during oh, the pandemic, yeah. and that was awesome. Kept the, the TV crew working, That's kept awesome. the restaurants going, and hopefully kept people I'm worried about the burger. Is it going to burn? No. no. Oh, no. Master Does that look burnt? Get in and take no. a shot of that burger. That it is real good. Can you do that on a grill, right guy? Point. That is impressive. This is on a plancha, so just basically like a flat cast iron skillet. Hunter's got pickles, tomatoes, and onions down right here. And like I said, this is the signature burger that we do mm. at all the Guy Fieri restaurants. We'll hit a couple pieces of bacon uh, on yeah. top of that. Hunter will hit a wow. little bit of lettuce. So on good. top of that, let's get some so onion good. straws. <laughs> of course. Yeah, a little touch of vinegar. If you were in there the studio right now, I would take a bite of that giant burger and embarrass oh, yeah. myself on national television. Let, yeah. Hey, I'm going to send you this burger. That's <laughs> what you need to be thinking about. Yeah. Yeah. I, like, that. I pay 100 Put bucks to see you take a bite of that. Box. That's that a beautiful burger. That in his face looks so good. Guy, yeah. you, honestly, almost $25 million. You've done so much for your own industry. So, I mean, Craig said it. God bless you for that. Hunter, go back to bed. I mean, don't even... <laughs> No, no. You can't say goodbye to Hunter. Why? You Wait, take a tell bite. Tell me where you want me to send this. <laughs> I want, I want to take Rockefeller a bite. Plaza. Okay, so you yeah. take a bite, guy. All right, all right. Somebody just said that they were going to give thousands of dollars to, to the program if we, if we oh, take a bite. That? So Hunter's back on the fourth. You know, this is breaking. Oh, this is the breaking the breakfast uh, champion routine. There you go. This is all for you, Al. All right. I know Yum. you appreciate this. Here we go. This. Oh, it looks good. Yeah, watch the technique. We're living through you, right? There we go. Yeah. Yeah. Love it. That's how we're there back. About. And for the recipe there, you can check it out. Head to today.com slash food. Thank you, boys. We'll see you in a couple hours. Thanks, guys. This morning on Today Food, dinner and a dash. We're talking weeknight meals, ready to eat in less than 30 minutes. 30 minutes or less. Mm -hmm. Valerie Bertinelli, two mm -hmm. words for you. Hamburger. Helper. Yeah. I haven't had hamburger helper in like 25 years. It, it's ridiculously easy to do. It's that one of those comfort foods that just stick to your gut. It's oh, that you guys are already enjoying it. So bad. And I'll show you how easy it is. Literally, you just get the ground beef ground okay. up. And, and nice and browned. Add in the spices. We got a little bit of salt. We got a little bit of paprika and uh, mustard and garlic. Okay. Onion powder. And you get could swap out there. the beef, obviously, for turkey. Or, you could absolutely okay. do that. And um, when I get to the... Um, the macaroni. See, I'm just toasting up the spices here right now. Okay. And getting some flavor on there. And then this is an all one pot. I don't like to dirty a lot of dishes mm -hmm. yeah. when I'm cooking in the kitchen on a weeknight. So I'm going to throw all the macaroni into the same pot. Oh, and it's not cooked when you when you throw nope, it. Nope, not cooked. It's wow. going to cook up, and and the, all of the starch from the macaroni is going to thicken up the oh. cheese mixture. Oh. So we got some water in there. You got to get some milk in there. Little milk. Oh, so oh, good. That's a milk. Whole milk. Whole milk. Yeah, of course. Yeah, come on. I mean, there's all the cheese and everything else. What are you going to Why, 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 why skip on the milk? The milk? Yeah. It's true. That's a good point. So that all gets uh, heated up, and then it turns into this young, unctuous, lovely, mm. like, oh, there's a bunch of uh, cheddar cheese in there. I got sharp cheddar and regular American cheese. Get, that gets all mixed up, and you can see how thick it gets mm. just from the heat and just um, thickening up from the starch. So you use right two there. kinds of cheese. I use two kinds of cheese. You can use the white cheddar. You can use the, I like to get a little color in there. So that's the cheddar I, I use. I love that you add the American. It adds just a tang that mm -hmm. makes yeah. it much more comforting. Right? I mean, American cheese and burger meat go together. Yeah. Like, they're meant to be together. Yeah. What are you topping it with? Here? I'm going to top it off with a little bit of onion. Oh. And just get that right over it. Make it look all pretty. Now, you can also um, use... Um, Gluten-free pasta, I made it with gluten-free a few mm -hmm. weeks ago, yeah. and it worked just as well. Sometimes mm -hmm. the gluten-free doesn't get um, let off as much starch, right. so you just add a little cornstarch in there, just okay. a tiny bit, and What's that'll What's the verdict, ladies? I mean, delicious. The yummiest. Good. The best. So Good. Delicious. And again, you, this, you say 30 minutes. You could probably do that in like 20. Well, just you need, you're waiting yeah. for the pasta to cook. Yeah. yeah. To get al dente. That's all it is. And kids would love it, too. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's delicious. It's still, it's still, I mean, it's so tasty. Kids would love it. And it's easier than the box. All right. Now, you want dessert? 
Mm -hmm. I do want dessert. Yeah. I always okay. want dessert. So I'm I got some. It. This is Wolfie's absolute favorite dessert mm -hmm. every um, this time of year. It's pumpkin pudding, and uh -huh. you're going to make your own pudding, and you're going to realize uh -huh. how easy it is. So we got a little bit of cream in here. We got some pumpkin puree. Always get the pumpkin mm -hmm. puree, not the oh pumpkin God. pie mixture, oh. because you want to add all your oh, own spices. Pie. You want to add Ooh. the ginger and pumpkin the nutmeg pie. and the cinnamon and all the things mm -hmm. and all spice that go in here. What are these? Those are ginger snaps, and oh. those are, mm. we're, we're going to layer the pudding with ginger snaps. I'm getting ahead. Get ahead. So get you got, we got our wet ingredients My here. Goodness. We need to separate the eggs. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. That's a very soft shell. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, I've never yeah. seen you do that on your show. <laughs> you know, you've out. never done that. <laughs> well, I'm going to get that yolk out anyway. So we're going to separate the eggs from the, from the shell. Right. Yeah. <laughs> there. So... You know what? Mistakes happen in the kitchen there you go. all the time. Live TV. Yeah. So, you go, oh, wait. First, I got to get the cornstarch in here. Right. Look, I'm all for clumps now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> a little bit of salt. Don't ever be afraid of putting salt into your sweets. Mm -hmm. It's going to really just take the flavor that much. Like, it's just, oh, I used the, oh, shoot. <laughs> I should have saved it for this. this. Okay, so well, well, you know what? Let me, um, here, here's a, well, that's not a whisk down there. That's all right, oh, we well. can still use Anyway, you mix this up. You're going to mix this up. Oh, uh, <laughs> Get the egg in there. Yeah, you know what? Uh, why not? Why not? Get the egg yolks in there. Mix that all together. Uh -huh. That cornstarch is going to then protect mm -hmm. you Thanks. as you. That's very good. Right? Thank you. I'm very Thank you, impressed. Thank you, Val. Better than me uh, chopping up these <laughs> eggs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so then, after we're done here, after you want to temper this now with this hot mixture of the milk and the and the puree and the spices. Oh, it's going to go in the. Oh. And you start tempering this together and mix it together. Oh, I'm this is that. just. <laughs> I mean. <laughs> so, <laughs> in the kitchen. I, I swear it. it's much easier than what I'm making it. <laughs> Thank you, Craig. Then you get. That that all mixed together, and somehow it magically turns into this. <laughs> yes. Go, Valerie. <laughs> and you have a little bit of butter at the end to top it off, and a little bit of vanilla when it's cooled yeah. down because you don't want to heat up the vanilla. Yeah. <laughs> so you were at the New York wine show? That, what was it, the food? Yeah, wine I, I cook for a living. I actually got two Emmys for my show. I'm just saying. That box. Saying, that's all. Yeah, there's so a new I, app coming out. Yeah, there's a new app. You can cook along with me on the new app. All right. Yeah. I'm going to... I'm going to sample it. You know what, though? It turned out great. It, by the way, it it Valerie. so delicious. By the way, another reason to love Valerie Bertinelli, yeah. don't you think? Oh, oh my gosh, good. I love another. That's good. I love you, Valerie. It's like pumpkin pie. It is, better. isn't it? Yeah. Valerie, so thank yeah, you. Ginger You're very welcome, Craig. Uh, Today.com <laughs> slash food for the recipes. Today food. We are making a simple and filling summer salad. Yes. Joining us now, one of our favorites, the founder of Fit Cook Meals, Kevin Curry. Cheeseburger is one of my favorite things. I yes. like to eat a salad. Yes. Sounds pretty good together. This How do is, we do it? All right. First off is the sauce because the secret's always in the sauce. Yes. So you're gonna take a, um, you know, like a pickles and just dice them up really, really finely. Oh. If you can't do this, just go ahead and buy some relish. You can buy sweet relish okay. or you can buy just the dill relish. Okay. All right. So we're gonna add in some pickles here. Let me tie this up just a little bit finer. Yeah. Okay. Nice knife, Add nice skills there. There you go. Add that into the sauce. Now, 
For the sauce, we're gonna use olive oil mayo. It's a little bit lower in fat. Oh. I know, don't, Where do you, I know I just never heard of that. Where do you olive find oil olive mayo? oil mayo? In the grocery I mean, store. It's, it's, the, pretty, the it's, it's really easy. All right, and then some Greek yogurt. This is gonna boost the protein, but also add that little tanginess in there. Al's, <laughs> Al's heckling me. I know, well, so I didn't know. I thought mayonnaise was mayonnaise. Did you know, Hoda? There's I, avocado. No, there's no, there's avocado no base. Idea. No. Okay. Okay. okay, it's a little lighter. Okay, olive oil. Right. Great. Coconut sugar for that smokiness. These things out. Some smoked paprika. Mm -hmm. A little bit of that smokiness. Yes. Onion. And then we've got some vinegar here. Yeah. And then some olive oil. I'm going to have you whisk this. Okay. And I'll then this it. is just some water. And okay. you're going to just add some water until okay. you reach your desired consistency. Okay, I like this. This is also going to be dressing. Now, this is good for burgers and stuff, y'all, but it's also good for salads, mm. for, like a, yeah, for the like cookout. The it's, a spe special it's, a, sauce. it's a today's special sauce. You know I'm like looking out for y'all. There you go. Thank you. All right. Now, it's a little chunky because I have those pickles in it. Yes, yeah. but okay. you can try to put, you know, like finer, too. Yeah. Oh, oh that best. looks great. Thank you. Perfect, y'all. Good, good, good job. Recent hey, I know. She's cooking, cooking okay. today. Uh -huh. All right. Now, we have got the protein. The protein yes. is super important. So this is some lean beef, but yeah. you can also use turkey, chicken, whatever. You're gonna season it up with some garlic. Am and I just some onion. Yeah, throw just put, it all yeah, on there? Just put it in there. Now, really important, whenever you're cooking up your meat, it I may have some water. Okay, that's that's too, well, yeah. Well, I we know, can, I don't know. I was trying, oh my. you know what I was thinking, like sprinkle, oh, and oh, it would be sprinkle. more evenly just Okay, but, that, but that's with the pepper, oh, though. Wow, we can just pour it oh, like okay, that. Okay. It's okay, we got it, we got it. Sorry. Yeah, this is it's all good. Pounds of meat. The most important okay. thing is that if you have a whole bunch of liquid here, you don't yes. want boiled meat. So just Ooh. drain your meat, yeah. put it back onto the heat, okay. and yeah. sear it up some more. Add this in there, sea salt and pepper. Remember, mm -hmm. we got to do this. This is live television. Make mm -hmm. sure they know we mm -hmm. season our food yeah, here. Exactly, because yeah. they'll yell at you. Yes, so we you know they will. <laughs> okay. We did, we did. Sea salt, more pepper, salt. there you go. Okay. Boom, boom, boom. Now. For the salad, we're gonna chop up some romaine here. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah. I like to have mine like pretty finely because I want every single bite to have something in it. Yes. Now, we've got cherry tomatoes. You can have them or, you know, quarter, quarter them. them. Yep. Add it to our salad here. Mm -hmm. Now, in goes the beef or yes. your protein. What's a cheeseburger without what? Oh, you gotta have a little cheddar Add cheese. Add a little cheese. Oh, there yeah. we go. Some onion action. Why don't nice. you go ahead and toss that together for okay. me? And I'm gonna add in some of our secret sauce. Okay. And you just tell me when to say stop. No, I'd say keep on going. That's right. Oh, hey, some more sauce, right? right. More. Do you love that sauce? More. You yes. can use the sauce on a, a slew of things. Mm -hmm. Yes, you can on use fish. it on anything. Does it keep it in the fridge for a couple it days? It keeps in the fridge, yeah. but it's not going to last long because you're going to eat it. Yeah, it's so true. Okay. You're going to smear it now. You can have this as a tossed salad, but I love mine in a wrap, y'all, because, you know, this is all about grab and go for the summertime. I'm going to put a little bit more sauce here on this wrap. Why don't you go ahead? This looks great. Oh, thank you. This is like restaurant quality. I'm, I'm so, I'm so impressed. Show, I've chef. shared before. <laughs> okay. Use these tongs. Uh -huh. We're going to put that in there. Okay. Add that to the wrap. Mm -hmm. Now, you can't have a cheeseburger without the sesame seed bun. Oh, this could be a nice them. lunch for oh, kids or like even a kid camp lunch. If Absolutely. You, you may want to add too some, much. I think that's fine. Okay. We're going to add in some oh. sesame seeds. Oh, yeah. We're going to add in some pickles as well Love if you it. want some more. All right. Now, do you know how to wrap up a, a wrap? No, we show me. The, okay, show here me we go. So technique. this is this is what I, I do. I can swaddle a baby. I'm for, but this yeah, I don't you gotta know. do this right here. All right. Okay. Now, now once you do this, you're gonna put it to one side. Okay. Hold oh, it, interesting. Pull oh, it over. Oh, 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 oh. I never knew that's that. Then, yes. Yeah. And then there you go. Oh it my is wrapped. Wow, wow, you did that snug now, as a oh, fucking rock. Yes. And you know, and you should also think about toasting them too. You know, so oh. once this is empty, put that back into the skillet, you know, toast it. Oh, yeah, yeah, get it nice and crispy, toast like restaurant wrap, style. Like just put yes. it in there. Oh, nice. And then toast Delicious all the sides stuff. of it. People are gonna be like, yo, I like look that. that.
for today. Food loves football to get you ready for the big Sunday night battle here on NBC. Pittsburgh Steelers, L.A. Chargers, here to get us in the spirit with some game day eats. Cookbook author and restaurant owner Adrian Calvo. Adrian, thank you for being here. It's oh Shirley out on the plaza. Hi. Savannah joins Woo. us. We're going to start with this beautiful Italian sandwich. Yes, an outrageous Italian sandwich. It is outrageous. Maximum flavor style. Lots of flavors. We have here some ciabatta bread, some fresh mozzarella. Yep. Got to use the fresh stuff. Mm. We're going to cut that into about quarter inch pieces. Okay. Now, don't skimp on the fresh stuff. Building yeah. ingredients, using great ingredients is, is That makes a difference. Yeah. Why do you like the yeah. ciabatta? The chewiness, but the lightness of it as well. But yep. you know, any rustic Italian bread really will do. Mm -hmm. So okay. you get some pesto down? Pesto down on both sides. I need a mm -hmm. chainsaw <laughs> for this. And then we're gonna start pressing our meats. Now I like to use pepperoni, prosciutto, salami, mm. but guess what? You have turkey and ham left over for Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. Swap that out, okay? Do I do so, the layer on the cheese the now? Same. Please layer it here. We have some sliced oh. up as oh, well. Geez, okay. Yes. Oh, Adrian, that is that's Isn't that fantastic? fantastic? So we lay on some this? peppers, pepperoncini. It should look like this. We press it. it smells so good. With something heavy in the fridge overnight. Oh, the skillet. The skillet goes on like this. Yep. Okay. Is you this have, a Pittsburgh thing? Yes. You oh, have, look at that. Gorgeous. Look at this, guys. <laughs> that's yes. my half, that's half. Yeah. I like that. This is I like delicious. That. <laughs> Next. You know, it's not football without a queso, without a cheese dip, yes. right? That's right. So we have here some chorizo, okay? Now we're going to use some Oaxaca cheese or, you know, any any type of creamy, melty cheese mm -hmm. will work, okay? So we saute it like so uh -huh. over medium-high heat. Okay. Now the flavors really come out here. This is one of the most important steps. Okay. Now just to get a good mm. saté of the chorizo first. We have exactly. our tasting okay. table, guys. How is the now, Pittsburgh sandwich? Here, it's good. We're like going that? to no, add that in a casserole. Dish. Dish. You're moving it into a casserole. Dish. Dish. Okay. Now we're going. <laughs> oh, now we're adding our. There you go. We're adding our Oaxaca cheese our Oaxaca or any cheese. melty cheese. Exactly. You can mm. mix cheeses as well too. Oh, sure if can. you can't get that type of cheese, provolone works well. Okay. Goes into the oven until it's nice and melty. Oh yeah. Melty. Yes. Serve it with tortilla chips okay. and some pico de gallo or oh, some yes. salsa. So delicious. That's maximum oh, flavor. It's so cold it kind of froze. Yes. It's supposed to be hot. It's super cold okay. here. Yeah, no. All right. Well. No. Okay. What's next? Next, we have our cheeseburger tots, mm -hmm. which oh, are cheeseburger tots. Cheeseburger tater tots. Yeah. You see? All it right. grabs your attention right wow. away. <laughs> we have some ground beef, some mm -hmm. onions, and who doesn't like onions and ground beef? Oh my gosh, right? All the so things. You saute that. Actually, you want to saute this for me? Oh, sure. Okay. If you think I can. Oh, absolutely. We're going to okay. add mayo right to the pan. Mm -hmm. Oh, some mayo. Interesting. Relish. And this is just ground beef and onions, right? Yep. Okay. Mustard. Not that you'd want to, but you could do ground turkey if you wanted to. Exactly. Or yeah. chicken. Okay. 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 So we saute that together. Here we have our tater tots. You're good. That's perfect. Okay. Oh, do you uh, want me to mix it more? Yeah. Mix yeah, it okay. until it's well How do you combined. make the tater tot a vessel for this burger meat? Here's the secret, guys. This is the secret. You use something like this, and you press the already baked tater tot. Oh, you make a shell. I do. Oh. Make you a make shell. the shell. Oh, it's just the back of a container yes. spoon thing. Exactly. Oh, if all else oh, yeah. fails, your thumb. Yeah. Now, that stuffing goes into okay. the potato. Yes. All right? And then we top it off oh, you got okay, the with some is pickles, pickle or a some oh, secret sauce. Now, are you baking this more, or is this yes, just, we're okay. going to bake it a little bit more. Oh, my God. Okay? Pickle, yeah. pickle goes on top, yeah. like so. Now imagine all these flavors, secret sauce, pickle. Like a Big Mac. Yes. Now the potato, the brown What are those little seeds? Sesame oh, seeds. Oh, sesame seeds. That's okay. Like your bun that yes. has, you know, the sesame seeds on top. How's it oh, taste, God. you guys? Carson, oh, you left God. the segment. You're just over there it's eating. Yeah, these the truth. So good. And if you have any of these left, pop them out as hors d'oeuvres for Thanksgiving. That's oh. so fun. Right? <laughs> I love it. What do you think, guys? So Is that maximum flavor? Insane. Thank you. Oh, insane. Well done, sir. Insane. The, insane. Insane. the queso's <laughs> off. <laughs> My queso right. was frozen. All right, awesome. Yeah, but these are great. But it's good cold, too. And mm -hmm. it's all easy. Anybody can I do told this. You. That is all right. delicious. All right. Okay, Adrian. You nailed it. Thank you so much. If you want to get more on these That's recipes, incredible. go to today.com slash food.
Welcome back. This morning on Today Food, Good. we are joined by the popular host of Tiny Mighty Kitchen <laughs> over on YouTube, Chef Kia Damon. Hi. She is here with a surprisingly easy dinner recipe that your whole family will love. And we were standing over and we were getting a whiff and I was like, oh, it's like I'm seven again. And it's yeah. like hamburger helping. Exactly, exactly. No, it's definitely a comfort food. Much better. <laughs> but better. It's definitely a comfort food, but um, it's super easy to make. First, you want to start with your onion. Okay. Now I'm going to go through, hold it, and slice it this way. Mm -hmm. And it really doesn't matter what size the onion is. It doesn't have to be, you know, restaurant-style size, but okay. you can get decent slices about here. Okay. And then you want to cut it down this way, and you see you already have it's already those diced. pieces, yeah, right? It's already that. diced, okay. right? Uh, so you got our onion there. What else you have goes our in? onion. Besides the onion, what else goes in? Garlic. Oh, so I like okay. to put, I'm a garlic girl, so I like to put a few a giant few cloves, cloves of garlic. And a great way to do that is to That's a put the pressure okay. on the yeah, knife like that. Too. And then use the whole clove. And then you use the whole clove, but okay. then you can just open it up. Got it. Like okay. that. And it makes it a little bit easier okay. to get that flesh on. Right, so give onion, us a little garlic. Kick. Right, onion and, and garlic. The garlic. Okay. And then you chop up that garlic oh, real quick like that. Okay. All right. And give it another little. <laughs> like that, oh, you know? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and then over here, so you're adding it to our pot. This is ground beef. I suppose yes, you could do so ground this, turkey if you, you were do, in that. You could do ground turkey if but you wanted to. But why would you? Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> no shade to the turkey community. No yes. shade at all. <laughs> There's a community? There's, There's a, a turkey, turkey community. community. There's a community for everything. Smart. They'll come for you, too. <laughs> all right. And then, so for the second time, then do you just add the broth Yeah, then you it? go ahead and add in your broth, okay. then your turkey, not your turkey. Now you can be thinking about oh, turkey. Oh, sorry, sorry. Add in your tomato paste okay. over here. Tomato paste. Nice. Up in the tomato Kia, paste. could you use this to hide vegetables for your kids in this? Yes. Now, if you want to do maybe a little bit of broccoli or a little bit of spinach, just to like put it in the cheese, then that would be okay there. for the children. You got some carrots. What's in the broth? Is it like a beef broth? Yeah. Okay. Just the beef broth. Put us some smoked paprika, mix mm. that in. Thyme. And then this beef broth here. Okay. Now, while I'm doing this, I actually would like for someone to grate I can do that, this sure. cheese here. So, he's a great grater. A really great idea and an easy thing to do you is you me. keep the cutter like this. Uh -huh. Okay. And oh, if you put the cheese part. over oh. like that, Another then it protein. fills up. You keep it horizontal. You keep it horizontal, what kind then of cheese it fills are we up. Using here? Just some cheddar cheese. Just Could you cheddar. finish it up for me, please? Yes, yeah, I like this because it's quick and homemade at the same time. Exactly. You know what I mean? They can lose the guild of the preservatives and what So you want to mix that in. Okay. How much cheese do I need? If you could get the, the more whole the block, better. but I doubt you could get the whole block. Oh, oh, you don't think so? Okay. I don't think you could do it. Okay, okay. <laughs> I'm trying it. So okay, challenge. now that pasta was not pre-cooked, right? No, because okay. what's going to happen is once you put all the liquid in here, mm -hmm. it's going to simmer over time. Got it. Oh. And then it's going to be done already. So this is going to stay on the stove top. That's going to stay on the stove top. Can't beat it. You're going to close that mm -hmm. like that. And then while you're working the on the cheese, right. <laughs> I'll be done I'm going to fan you. Whenever exactly. the cheese is actually finished, that seemed like a good idea. It'll look like this. <laughs> That's fantastic. No, I think you did a great job. No, absolutely. Please eat it. So you add the cheese over that. Roker, you resisted the Roker, you resisted the urge to make a comment about cutting the cheese. I'm so proud. Why yeah, should I when, exactly. I when I've got Craig Melvin to do it? No, I think oh you do God. an amazing job. But at this point, oh, you will add you the really cheese. You really do want this whole block of cheese. The, it's okay. <laughs> You're, <laughs> off the hook. You're off the hook. But you would ideally put okay. this cheese so into here. Uh -huh. After it's cooked, it's toward the end. And Kia, what, what, what do we have here? Oh, that's nutritional yeast. Instead oh. of cheese, if you want to keep it. Well, you add that in addition because it adds an extra punch oh. to the dish. So put a little bit of that nutritional really yeast on I use that on my kale. Yeah, yeah, just it's a little really bit. really good. Don't keep cooking. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yeah. And then you yeah, you the can't beat like this. this. I mean, Thank this you. Is 20 minutes. You know I mean? appreciate oh, that. So Thank good. you so very much. And the kids, kids can help. I was just about to say, they can help. And the kids can help. And I helped. Then you help. Thank you, Sophia. Thank you. No, thank this you so much. Terrific. Thank oh, you that for is having good. me, right? Yeah, I mean, thank you. I oh, appreciate that. that. Good. My kids will gobble that up. <laughs> yes. I might just take it home. Dinner is served. Yeah, All right. <laughs> Kia, thank you so much. No, thank, thank, you, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Be sure to check out her full recipe. It's today.com slash food. Good morning. It's a day to bundle up for millions of Americans. Yeah, Al's tracking the brutal cold, even some snow. It is November 28th. Good morning. This is Today.